For years now, people have been setting up a little contest between crypto and gold. But that's like comparing a truck with an SUV. Both carry stuff and travel from A to B, but they do different jobs. Gold's job is to keep the value of your money safe and preserve its value. And since Ukraine and the oil and inflation crisis, it's done a brilliant job compared to stocks and other investments. So if you're worried about what's going on right now, and who isn't, just talk to an expert at Noble Gold about precious metal IRAs for your retirement. They'll put you straight on your options and hold your hand through the whole setup process. And this month, for any qualified IRA, you'll get an incredible three-ounce silver American virtue coin completely free as a thank you. Call 877-646-5347 now to find out more. Visit noblegoldinvestments.com. That's noblegoldinvestments.com. Welcome, y'all, to another episode of I'm Doing Great, the podcast with myself, Mike Lerner, and Gina Bontempo. Did you guys like that little ad that we had before? You didn't mm, see it. I haven't seen it yet. No. <laughs> You will once this comes out. Am I going to approve of it? Noble Gold. Go check them out. Noblegoldinvestments.com. You get a free coin or something. Oh. I think, yeah. I want a free coin. Yeah, I think we get one. I don't know. Who knows? Well, I hope um, so. We've got a very interesting guest today in the studio, so I'll allow Gina to do a little quick introduction, and then we'll get right into yes. it. Yes. Our guest is many things. She's a friend of mine. We met online, as many friends do. Um, she's a mother of two. She's a doula, which if you don't know what a doula is, she's going to explain what that is. She's a trainer. She's a birth fit coach. I might be missing some stuff. She's Emily Stanwick. Welcome to I'm Doing Great. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you. Me too. Yeah. I liked the description of interesting. Yeah. Thank you. What would you have liked? No, that was perfect. Okay, good. I love that. No <laughs> wide shot today. So it's just, you can see now just my, my hands. Yeah. yeah. So you don't actually know that we're in the same room. Yeah, we are in the same room. <laughs> they don't know that. No, this remember could very when... well be on Zoom. Yeah, we could. <gasps> oh yeah. Oh. I came all this way. Do you remember when back in the <laughs> early days of I'm doing great, people were like, "I don't know that you guys are in the same room." Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Shut up. Because we had different walls. You were really upset oh. about our different walls. Yeah, and then I had a green screen for a while. People like the green screen, but this is better, right? We're all this right here. This is lovely. I like this. I liked the green screen when you had Putin riding the bear. Yeah, that was the first one. That was a great green screen. Yeah, and then That's awesome. I had another one with Paul McCartney uh, holding a gun. People didn't really understand that. <laughs> they don't mean anything. So Emily, what's a doula? Great question. I thought that it was, I was asking my wife last night. I was like, wait, so a doula is like, they're just like a spiritual midwife. And my wife was like, no, that's not what they are. I mean- that's not far off. Yeah. But she said they're like a companion. Yes. That yeah. is a great way of explaining it. Um, I was first introduced to the term doula and was given the comparison of a birth coach. Mm. Like you're in the delivery room coaching them through labor. And at the time, fitness was my primary thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that, oh my God, that's me. I'm a doula. I've been like obsessed with pregnancy and babies my whole life. I always knew I wanted to be a mom. I always watched a baby, a baby story on TLC. You remember that? I don't know what that is. What? Her Instagram's pretty graphic. <laughs> is it really? Wait, what, it is kind not of. graphic compared Wait, to kind other. Of. Your, my you Insta her Instagram? Yeah. Like is the birth it? stuff You see I like post? babies and almost vaginas and oh, heads popping that out. That one, yeah. But, oh my oh, gosh. Oh yeah, you share a couple of those photos. I yeah. do. You yeah. should. You're Don't not following enough birth Instagrams. <laughs> well, we had to we had to watch the, a couple of those videos because our uh, was it the gyno? Oh no, the Lamaz lady was like, "Here, uh -huh, watch uh -huh. these videos," because she did Zoom classes with us <clears throat> because the aunt right. wasn't able. To, anyway. Uh, and yeah, we had to watch different birth stories. And Men don't like watching babies come out of other women's vaginas, and no. I get that. No, I get that. Some men will say, "I'll tell the women, um, watch birth videos before birth." And the men are like, Ugh, I only want to see that happening to my wife. I was like, honestly, I totally get that. So you don't have to. Um, it's like watching another dog poop. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Wait, versus watching your own dog poop? Yeah, you're like, oh, okay, go ahead. It's like your other kid when you watch a kid I hate or another watching adult dogs gets poop. sick. I'll be you know honest. I, mean? I feel like it looks painful when I, I watch it. my dog poop. I'm like, are you okay, girl? Yeah. Like it just looks. Like anyway, anyway, what's yeah, a doula? <laughs> yeah. Back to the doula. Back to the doula. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so birth coach was how I like was given the comparison. And the way that my doula described it was a shepherd guiding you through the birth process. She's like, I'm not doing anything for you. Mm. I am guiding you through this process. And I thought that was really special. I'm like, you, you're a mother. You've been through this before. It was so interesting that I can't, became a doula before becoming a mom. And nothing wrong with that. But it, I really got it on a deeper level once I became a mom. Another way to think of a doula in more like literal terms is a midwife or a doctor is waist down. A doula is waist up oh, support. Gotcha. So I am like emotional support. I have walked the walk. I have helped other women walk the walk. 
I am there to keep you focused on your plan. I am there to keep you not panicking. Mm -hmm. I am there to, for your husband mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that he doesn't feel like he has to make decisions. Yes. Like he is really supported and held so that he can just be husband and dad for yeah. his wife. And so a large part of the role of the doula is arriving at your house before you go to the hospital or before Homebirth. midwives come. Mm. So I'm there really as you transition from early to active labor. And ideally, you're not calling people in or leaving until you're in that active labor space. Obviously, there's every birth is different. But ideally, I am there supporting you before your care provider is. But are you, and, but you're there during the birth. Too, I am right? also there during the birth. And so okay. part of that is like maybe suggesting position changes mm -hmm. or reminding you to drink water, reminding you to eat, reminding your husband to eat, yeah. reminding your husband to go take a walk around the block if he's getting overwhelmed. Wait, I thought they can't eat though. Oh, no. We'll get into that too. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. That's There's a common a, misconception? We're going to get into a lot of myths. Yeah. I want to also add one thing about what a doula is, what our doula was for me. I also want to say we considered having Emily as our yeah. doula, but because we live in different states and it was- I selfishly was like, it will be fine. I'll be there. I'll just <laughs> hop on a plane. But I was like, no, Emily. Yeah. And so we ended up going with a doula from here in the middle Tennessee area. And she was great. And one of the things that she did that I think a lot of doulas do is they advocate yes. for the mother and her husband- whenever they feel like they can't. So it, it, so a doula can be, I know this is a common question, are, aren't doulas only for home births? Doulas can be no. in, in a home birth or a hospital birth. We ended up having to have a hospital birth and my doula was really great because she advocated for us. And mm -hmm. what they do is they're the, they're the unbiased third party that yes. can often kind of encourage you to make decisions that you maybe like can't come to on your own. This is my definition that I tell all my clients. I say, a doula is a third party support person who is emotionally unattached, yeah. who creates a sense of safety. Yeah. Is it hard though, staying emotionally unattached? Like, what I mean by that, it is. But what I mean by that is, that's not my baby. Right, okay, So gotcha. that's what I mean. And okay. I tell them that. I'm yeah. like, I love you. I love your husband. I love what you are creating. I want you to get exactly what you want, but that's not my baby. So I can stay a lot more chill than your and husband. And objective. And objective. Right, yeah. Like yeah. I've been in situations where they're like, the nurses are like, we really recommend X, Y, Z now. And they look at me and I'm like, that's what I would do. Yeah. You know? And yes. so they're like, okay, cool. Do you know any yeah. mandulas? I actually know one. Yeah. And his name is Dr. Elliot Berlin. He's in LA. He's rad. He is a chiropractor and oh. he primarily works. He has a podcast too, birth stories and stuff. Okay. Um, He's super cool. So male doulas do exist. Man yes, doulas. they do. But yeah. he's a chiropractor and he works. Okay. He <laughs> specializes in prenatal and okay. postpartum. And many women have asked him to attend their births to adjust yeah, them wow. during labor. Wow. Really? He's like, so I'm kind of a doula now. So there yeah. is uh, there is no... There's no medical advice that you give. I mean, I kind of picture you as like the cut man or like the boxer's ring man, basically. Yes. You know, you're putting them out there, you're motivating them, you're keeping them in a positive uh, headspace. But there's nothing there. I mean, I would it, assume you can't give medical correct. advice because that would mm -hmm. open you up to liability like exactly. if anything happened. But exactly. midwives, correct. they're the ones that are kind of giving yes. any medical advice. Midwives place. are clinically trained in physiologic birth. I okay. don't like to use the term clinically. Mm-hmm. They specialize in out of hospital care. Right. Um, so yes, a doula cannot give medical advice. Mm -hmm. And with the clients I am now attracting, they ask my opinion. I share my opinion. Okay. I don't tell them what to do in their birth setting. It is a very fine line. For example, I was recently at a birth. The graphic picture yeah. on my Instagram of the baby coming out um, is my awesome friend Mel. I'm going to get you guys to follow her on Instagram. She's hilarious. But we found out the baby was breech. Her midwife was confident. But right when we found out the baby was breech, she looks at me and goes, so we go to the hospital now, right? I was like, no. Mm. And, you know, we got. Explain she, what breech is. Breech is not head down. Breach so is feet first? Sometimes it's feet first. That can be actually like quite dangerous. But butt first is really? what this okay. baby was. I They're was like folded in half. Cool. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and. Uh, but then is a variation of normal. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it's not taught in medical school anymore. 
because because I mean, people listening, you've probably heard that the common thing is if a baby is breech, you have a C-section. Yes. It's just like what you do. Mm-hmm. I was a C-section baby because yeah. I was breech and that's just my mom was in the hospital. It's just what you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they don't teach it in medical school anymore. So it's like specialty trainings. Um, the OB I work for, Dr. Stu in L.A., he only does out of hospital births for twin and breech babies in California because those are both illegal for midwives to deliver in California. Illegal. But they're trained in it. Do you agree? But he can because he's an, a medical doctor. Hold on. Wait, do you, do you agree with that? Oh, no. Okay. Absolutely not. So midwives should be able to deliver babies. Midwives here. are the only people who are regularly trained in breach and twin vaginal delivery. But twin who, vaginal delivery? Twin. Really? Yeah. So OBGYNs aren't necessarily like trained or go through specific training or to deliver those kinds of babies? What I'm told now is that in medical school, breach is like not being taught oh. you just have a c-section yeah oh. so mm. if i'm wrong please correct me um but that's just what and it's and the reason why i believe that is no one does breach vaginal deliveries except rad obese who do exist there are some rad gem of gems of obese who will do vaginal and breach delivery in hospital because they are confident in their capabilities or they've worked under a a very old doctor when they first started who was comfortable doing that before it was you know less of a less common Mm -hmm. but yeah it's illegal wait so in many states is it recommended that if you are delivering twins you get a c-section or no yes most often oh Oh, really oh i thought you just push them what did people do before what did people do before exactly they all died obviously (laughs) yeah geez (laughs) how do we get here right um no twins i think are teeny tiny bit more common vaginally in hospital yeah because you will likely have i mean not likely oftentimes twins can both be head down like one baby will be head down and then the other one once there's all that space once the first baby's out they'll just go down um so some doctors are more comfortable with twins depending on their position if uh with vaginal okay gotcha Mm. but all you hear about is C-sections for twins. Yeah. Really? So yeah. they're way more common. Oh, yeah. Oh, I don't I think I, I don't know any moms who had twins that didn't have a C-section. It's just wow. like they just schedule it. It's just something the, they do. That, that is yeah. what they do oh, now. You're saying all of them that you know had C-sections. All of them had all the moms I know. How who many have moms twins. do you know have twins? I know four. Oh, OK. That's I know a lot. four moms. OK. Yeah. I thought you. Were I know five. I know if we're one. counting her as like peripherally. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. You know I just have a. Acquaintance, we're not really friends, but um, who just had twins at home. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. And Dr. Student delivers twins at home all the time. Okay, speaking of home, let's yeah. start mm-hmm. by talking about home births. Yes. Because this is a very, it's a hot topic. Mm-hmm. Um, this is one of those things when it comes to pregnancy and motherhood that there's like two divided camps. Yes. So you have people <clears throat> that are staunch home birthers and mm-hmm. you have people that are staunch hospital birthers that look at home birthers and say things. We were talking about this in my kitchen, I think even last night or maybe this morning, how a lot of women who are like, who advocate more for, not even advocate, or who are a pro like hospital birth, Mm -hmm. they say things like, what, you want to be a hero? What, you want to be a hero and have a home birth? You don't need to be a hero. Why would you submit yourself to that much pain? Why would you put yourself in that much pain? I've heard this, I've heard this analogy before. (laughs) A mom literally told me once, she was like, listen, when you go to get your tooth pulled out, you're going to get medication, right? You're going to get pain medication before they pull it out. So why wouldn't you have an epidural before you have a baby? Mm. And I'm like, and so I, I want to get into that, but there are definitely two divided camps. And I feel like often this is one of the most frustrating things about mommy online communities is that they're always fighting, mm-hmm. right? The home birth <clears throat> people can sometimes be judgmental of women who choose to do a hospital birth, choose to get medication, pain medication, whatever. And then vice versa, hospital birth moms can be very judgmental of home birth moms. So I want to start... With home births, because yeah. the majority of the births that you do are home births, right? Um, now more, now yes. more. In yeah. LA, surprisingly, it was all hospital births. My birth was my first home birth. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start by talking about why women choose to do home births. Yeah. And <clears throat> what? Let's like break the myths, bust the myths of what the risks are of yes. doing a home birth. Yes. Um. Okay, there's so many reasons as to why women choose a home birth. I'll share maybe my journey. Yeah. Because I think it's relatable. Like, I knew I wanted to become a doula. It was 2014. And as soon as I became a doula, I just woke up to the fact that people have home births. And I didn't even, 
I don't even remember thinking about home births before I became a doula. Like I knew I always wanted kids, but it was hospital. That's all I knew. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, that sounds really nice. I want to give birth at home. Like it wasn't even this like aha moment. I was like, oh, that sounds nice. I'd do that. Right. So then I become a doula and I start attending births in hospital. And I really saw firsthand the um, the lack of power that women are subject to when they are in the medical system. I will say coercion mm-hmm. um, and abuse. Now, you had a great hospital birth. I'm not saying all women right. have this experience. Yeah. I've been to great hospital births. But um, it – really was like, whoa, that was not chill at all. Like I would leave births and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like there there were so many things that just were so uncomfortable for me. And um, even women who went in there knowing they were going to get an epidural, like they weren't trying for an all natural. It was just things came out of left field constantly, every birth I went to. And so I just knew, and I also never felt comfortable in a hospital. Like personally, I would, mm. I was like a, gr- a kid who always it's had stitches exactly and ear space. infections. Like I just, bad vibes in hospitals. I was like, oh, I cannot do that. That's cool. Like I definitely want to not be in the place where people go to die when I give birth. Um, and I just didn't like it. So a lot of women choose to give birth in, out of hospital because they don't want to subject themselves to medical mistreatment. And, and I say that knowing that there are doctors and nurses out there who are not intentionally doing this to people, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. they are trained, they are indoctrinated in their medical training. And I'm not saying they are not excellent at what they do, which is medicalized birth. But oftentimes medicalizing birth can lead to um, unintentional consequences mm. that – don't end well for women and babies. And so when you dive into the safety of of out-of-hospital care, you're like, at least for me, I was like, there's not even a risk. Like there was no risk of doing it at home. I knew that if there was an emergency, I wouldn't be in a hospital. Obviously, people would consider that a risk, but I trusted my midwives who told me explicitly, we know when to transfer before an emergency. You're not going to have an emergency at your house, Mm. you know? Mm. That made me feel really good, you know? The most common reason for a hospital transfer is exhaustion. People think hospital transfers are when everyone's crashing and dying. Exhaustion is the number one reason for transfer, by far. Um, which also made me feel really good. So I felt really safe with my midwives. I felt really good with my decision. I was like, this is going to be rad. So I chose it because I didn't want to have a medicalized birth. I knew I could do it also. Um, I just, and I wanted to feel it. I wanted to feel the pain of labor. And um, I knew that, like, if someone asks me, I'm kind of at the point in my doula life where if someone's like what's your advice for an unmedicated hospital birth i go what's your advice how do i do it like what would you recommend best way to have an unmedicated hospital birth i go i don't Hmm. i don't recommend having an unmedicated hospital birth well that's not an unmedicated birth you're having a medicalized experience even if you're have no drugs in you and I don't want to take your amazing birth away from any of you women out there who had a natural hospital birth because, honestly, that's harder to do than having a home birth, in my mm-hmm, opinion. Mm-hmm. If to go down the route of no drugs in labor and be in the hospital, damn, great job, yeah. you know? But if you want that unmedicated experience, why would you start in the hospital? You know, mm-hmm. of course, insurance and money and finances are all involved and there's all mm-hmm. of the aspects. So I'm not like shaming anyone for their choice. But that's my first advice is don't. I don't recommend it. Um, But women do want to feel the pain. They want to like reclaim what is inherently what female bodies do, Mm -hmm. which is give birth. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for Western medicine and that it does save lives when it is medically necessary. But uh, most of the medical intervention in the hospitals are unnecessary yeah so we're talking things like epidural 
C-section, mm-hmm. even being induced, Pitocin. like Pitocin. Yeah, I can had. I, can I can I tell Carly's story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just to see like what you would have done at this point. Oh yeah. Okay, so I think she was she was a back labor pregnancy. Right. So. I think that would that have been a red flag for first explain her? what back labor is so if people don't so know. So back labor, I believe, is when the baby's head is pressing against it's the, the spine. It's the, spine on spine. It's spine on spine. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was the head on spine, but it's spine on spine. Oh. It's very uncomfortable and very, very painful for a woman to go through. There's no respite. It's not like contractions where no, it's no, contract it's, and release. It's, that, it's well, constant. that's why I thought we had to go to the hospital a lot sooner because I was like, wow, your contractions, there's right, no time in right, between right, them at right. all. But with back labor, it's just they're unrelenting. Mm-hmm. Um, so would would a midwife knowing that she's going through back labor would, would a midwife suggest I you should probably go to the hospital for this? No, not necessarily. It kind of just depends on the woman's pain tolerance and if she's able to truly rest even for a minute. Like it's really taking a lot of things into account: heart rate of yeah. her, heart rate yeah. of baby, like actual like medical things, yeah. and then like emotional well-being yeah. um literal pain tolerance well, the, in, well the the interventions were needed because you know my wife wanted to have a natural birth mm-hmm. but i think the pain was she couldn't she couldn't settle into a position where there was right. no pain so she ultimately uh, uh, opted for an epidural and then when it came understandable time, yeah then when it came time to actually deliver uh, they noticed it wasn't dilated enough, mm-hmm. so they wanted to give her the pitocin. Mm-hmm. So she said okay, and that immediately dropped the baby's heart rate. Mm-hmm. Where you know mm-hmm. everybody comes rushing in mm-hmm. with like the drip was not even ten fifteen seconds, like that's how quick it was. Wow. So she was like, "Don't ever do that again. No, no more pitocin." Yeah. And that's where the doctors were saying, "Okay, well, listen, you're gonna have to have a C-section. Yeah. Like that's it's probably which hospital the, were you guys at? It was at uh, St. Thomas, Midtown. Yeah." And so we go up to do the C-section and I'm in there and she's not reacting to any of the local anesthesia. So they had to put her under and I had to leave. And that's kind of like one of those situations where it's like, damn, you know, I wish there was somebody, that, but you wouldn't even, you wouldn't have you know been what able to be, to be there though, right? Uh, in the hospital? Yeah. Depends on when it was. Because our can doulas go, let, like, let's say that it is a C-section. I've been in operating room. Some right, can. can. Some can. But I think in our situation where even I had to leave. Yeah, I they, would you, They probably would have. I, what I would have done, knowing what I know now at home, mm-hmm. was there's a website called spinningbabies.com. Mm-hmm. I would have done all the things and all of the exercises they recommend. Um, and I would have called a chiropractor over to my house and gotten adjusted oh, and really? see if that would have helped. For, yeah. the, back, for the back mm-hmm, labor stuff mm-hmm. too? Oftentimes when baby is in a wonky position, it's just, it can, baby can move with some stimulation of the nervous system and or... Adjusting your back and your pelvis creates space. Maybe where there was tightness in your oh, pelvic floor. Um, oh. Would I have thought of that in the moment when I was in labor? I right. don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like answering now in hindsight, I I would have, if I had remembered, I would definitely have done that. Even yeah. acupuncture, I would have been like, I'll spend a thousand dollars. Everyone just come to my house and like try and help me. Um, yeah, I back like- labor is gnarly. Yeah. From oh what no, I've heard. Just, like, just watching it was not good it's just bone on bone on the inside yeah does does home labor get a bad rap from media for whatever reason oh yeah there was this movie that recently came out you know you know the one i'm talking about with the with the shia labeouf it's a shia labeouf look it up i forget the name of it um but it was about a woman who has a home birth Mm -hmm. with a midwife Mm -hmm. they deliver the baby but you see you know after the baby's delivered the midwife is kind of looking at the baby Like, oh, it's not breathing, it's not breathing. Or so- something happens mm-hmm. where the midwife, I guess, calls an ambulance too late. Oh. Something happens, the baby passes away in the movie. And then I think litigation starts with oh, the tragedy. Oh, Pieces stop. of a Woman. I yeah. have never heard of this. It's it a good is, cast. It is intense. Yeah. And, you know, we watch, I think we watched this after uh, our baby was born. But uh, I, th- I feel like they get bad raps. Like, they think, like, only hippies just want home births yeah. and stuff like that. So that is... An incredible observation that home births get a bad rap. Did you know that medical malpractice is the third leading yeah, cause of yeah, death I do, in America? I do know that, yeah. Did you know that we have one of the worst maternal mortality and infant mortalities yeah. in yeah. America? Yeah. In the world? In the world, yeah. And 99% of American women give birth in hospitals? Yeah. 99? 99. 99. So why does home birth get the bad rap? Of course, babies die at home yeah. and, and mothers die at home. It's horrible. But with life comes death and... If you believe in God 
or a higher power, I think we have the ability to come to terms with the fact that death is part of life and mm. you go into pregnancy with that yeah, fear and anxiety yeah. and reality and do it anyway, mm -hmm. right? So why do we blame the midwives? I mean, I blame the doctors, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're in, a, you're in a different position too, yeah. Why do we blame the midwives for babies dying in births when we don't blame doctors for babies dying at births. Yeah. So do we know the statistics of how many births, how many home births end in in death versus how many I do not. hospital births? Or even you have a computer let's, in front of you. So let's there are even, not a lot of home birth let's see. Um studies. Well, I'm they, gonna they talk about that. Yeah. yeah. There can't be exactly yeah. so I have one that I'll I'll share about. Yeah, well let's talk about it now. Yeah. Okay, so Right I now. don't have the mortality rates. That yeah. I don't have. But I want to share these amazing statistics. This is a good segue. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hospital birth statistics. So this is a study of over 17,000 women, I believe, between like in like a five-year period. Okay. So a good sample size. Is it relatively recent? Yes. Okay. This study came out in 2021. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll share the link with you so you have um, the study. Okay. Induction rate of 36%. In What's America. that mean? Induction. Meaning doctors medically inducing labor gotcha. to begin. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, we have a 79% epidural rate. Wow. Wow. Of how many? 17,000? Yeah. I'm just doing the math. Whoa. That's like, that's, well, that's over. Well, actually, the, you know what? I think the 17,000 was home birth. I'm going to have to go back and okay, look. Okay. Okay. Because these are just uh, hospital statistics, which we do have lots of data on. Yeah, of course. So, this so is almost 80% of hospital births are have epidurals. Wow. Epidural. Okay. Yes. 33% yeah. um, cesarean section. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you know that the WHO, which, you know, <laughs> you take their information with a grain of salt, but this I happen to agree with, healthy nation should have a cesarean rate of under 10%. Under 10. I've heard that. Okay. We have 33, That's getting closer three. to 35 now. Yeah. Um, and uh, we only have a 13% VBAC rate. What's that? In oh, hospitals, really? vaginal birth after cesarean. 13. 13. Wow. Wait, vaginal birth after cesarean? Correct. So what does so that, like mean? that mean? Oh, that means you have the next shot. Okay, the next gotcha. Yeah. gotcha. Because most doctors, they, they, they don't recommend a do vaginal it. birth after a cesarean. Because oh. they're lazy. I thought they... I thought, oh wait, they you do thought, recommend it just because the scars there, and it's just, it's like, hey, that's where we did it last. There's time. no actual reason for the recommendation. Really? They they scare women into believing that they will have. Does it cost have, more? <laughs> yeah. Does it cost oh, more to get absolutely. the C-section? Oh, yeah. Heck okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they, um, they scare women into believing that they are at a higher risk of uterine rupture, which you are, but it's. It's unbelievably marginal between, because you can have a uterine rupture having not had a cesarean. So the difference between, so there's like uterine rupture statistics and then there's VBAC uterine rupture statistics and they're teeny tiny difference. Mm. So they scare women into thinking that they have to get a C-section or get induced at 39 weeks, right. which will often lead to a C-section um, because their uterus could rupture. And they, and they just... They just perpetuate fear. Really, I have a, I have a friend. But right VBACs now are very very normal out of hospital. Yeah. VBACs. Yeah. Oh. VBACs. I have a friend My right now who's over overdue right now. I guess because she's over she's, the due date. Yeah. According to the, the docs. Doctor. Yeah. Okay, so listen to these home birth statistics. By okay. the way, I don't hate all doctors, <laughs> but. Our birth is so medicalized. Our birth system well, is so saying. medicalized. that's what I'm saying. You don't hate all doctors. You no, probably no, just no. hate the birthing medical industry. The system industry, is, right? like, is in a crisis. Okay. Okay. So here are home birth statistics. 89% of births are completed at home. Okay. Wow. That's really high. Really high. Do you know the sample size of that one? I believe this is the 17,000. Okay. okay. Yeah. 93% um, vaginal birth rate. So wow. 7%... Uh, C-section rate, okay, which is considered normal. Like those would be medically necessary, meaning you are at home, right. you transfer for a reason, baby not coming, yeah. C-section. More often than not, out of hospital, Less transfers than, yeah. are a Under medically 10%. necessary C-section. Less than one in 10, wow. Okay. Yes. 87% yeah. um, VBAC. Wow. Yes. Hmm. So almost... The exact opposite. The exact opposite. Wow. 
or inverse. That's incredible. And then 97% breastfeeding success rate. And why that matters is oftentimes when you have medically induced births, especially when you are induced too early, your milk doesn't come in and then your baby needs food. So they supplement with formula and then mom's too stressed out to try. Yeah. Our baby just didn't never latch correctly. So she, she, uh, nursed no she pumped. breastfed mm-hmm. but didn't nurse pumped oh so yeah. oh, so she, she never latched no never latched. Oh. No. yeah i wonder if that ha- that probably doesn't have anything to do with the actual birth c-section right? sometimes they can pull the baby by the head in a different really? way than it would come out i mean this happens with vacuum births and forcep births or aggressive uh just manual well you were aggressively manual right Mine was. Yeah. 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 So because we again, I would take your up. baby to the chiropractor when they're just a couple we days did old. That. Yeah. We did that. Um, helped a lot. We helped really? a lot with our like latch. Days old. Oh. And oftentimes a latch can be something like a tongue tie or lip tie too. Yeah. So yeah, we were concerned about that, but I mean, luckily she latched and the some, day up. And honestly, and this is the unfortunate side effect of a C-section is sometimes the C-section just mom is traumatized from the C-section and is yeah. too exhausted. I'm not. This is not right, a right, right, yeah. Um And just at that point it doesn't matter in that moment and then when they come out of the fog they're like oh no wait now i now it's too late well imagine mine an hour later that's when she met our daughter an hour later. oh my god oh my god can you can you look up what is the amount of women who have to be put under for their c-section oh that i'm curious about it's probably a low number i don't imagine it it happens all the time but i mean do you know how many births there are in america every year that's a good question. I would say, obviously, it's probably in the hundreds of thousands. I would say maybe 10%. No, it has to be less than 10% of mothers have to be put under. I would agree. I would, I would assume that. It can't but be. how crazy is that? An 89% of births completed at home, meaning healthy, live babies. Right. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. So why are people so scared? And not all of those people look like me. And not saying that looking like me means anything, but I'm people look at me like... Part you're of big. Babies just fall I'm out of big, you. I'm big. I'm muscular. And people are like, you're so strong. Right. Of course, it was easy for you. It's like, uh, no, it was still hell on earth. Yeah. And it wasn't easy. Um, did my previous life as an athlete help my mental toughness? 1,000%. Yeah. Um, but not everyone looks like me. There's right. just a lot. All different people give birth at home. Yeah. All different races. Yeah. All different. Sizes. Sizes. Even the teeny tiny ladies, when you know, even you s- the teeny tiny ladies. Yeah. I mean, I in Santa Monica, I'm like, okay, if this tiny yoga lady gave birth at home, I, I, I always can do thought that. about the tiny yoga ladies. Yeah. They're like scrawny, yeah, and they just like pop. Carly's yeah. tiny. Carly's tiny. She didn't pop that out though. That's yeah. yeah. I just think there's there's so much fear around yes. birth in general <clears throat> and pregnancy, and oh, I that's understand something else I want to talk about. This is perfect. And I understand why because I think that pregnancy and birth is the most awesome thing that humans can do and when i say awesome i mean like to be in awe of yes right to be in awe of the fact that a woman can morph her body and grow a child mm-hmm. in there for nine months this is why i always say i've said it a couple times on the show before i don't know how anybody can be pregnant and give birth and not believe in god Agreed. And, and so i totally understand why there is so much fear around pregnancy and birth i mean even when i was a teenager i would sit i always knew i wanted to be a mom i would sit at night and be like Oh my God, do you mean that a, a baby has to come out of there? What do you mean? I've never watched a birth before. Oh. My doula was like, do you want to watch a birth? I was like, I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. <laughs> Don't want to see it. And she was like, that's fine. Yeah. And even when like, I was pushing, my OB was like, do you want to grab a mirror and see? I'm like, I'm good. What? I'm good. Oh, yeah. really? Apparently a lot, a lot huh? of women like Would to do that. Would you look at the mirror? Um, nah, I was too distracted. Yeah, I'm see, that's I'm just okay. like in my head. I, that's why I wanted to just like focus, but I totally understand why it's a scary for anything. So birth and pregnancy is already scary for women. Yes. It's already a terrifying experience because it is, it's unknown. It's unknown. It's scary. There are a lot of risks. I mean, you're doing something incredible it with your body. It is a life and death situation. And you have this, and it's your baby, mm-hmm. you know, it's not like it's some inanimate object. It's your child. So there's so much fear and anxiety around. And I get that, but I think what you and a lot of other doulas talk about, which is really important to understand, is that the mainstream medical industry, they capitalize on that fear Mm -hmm. and they capitalize on the anxiety and the insecurity and the unknown. And they do coerce women into making decisions that they don't really necessarily need to make in the moment. They say things like, 
well, you don't want your baby to die, do you? Exactly. They say they say terrible things like yeah. that. And it's like, I feel, we talked about this last night too, I feel so fortunate that every, literally every step of my hospital birth was incredible and we loved it. We yeah, loved the whole staff. Amazing. I love my OB. If you live in the Middle Tennessee area and if you need an OB recommendation, let me know because my OB is incredible. He's amazing. But I know so many moms who have had a traumatic experience at hospitals. So and unfortunately, I think we're now getting to the point where it's more common for women to have an experience, a birthing experience at the hospital that they maybe like didn't want to have. I've had in the past year, I know two moms who had a C-section who said a couple weeks after the fact, I thought about it and I was like, I didn't need that C-section. I don't think I needed it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that over 25% of them are unnecessary. <laughs> so here's to top on to add on top of that. The fear of childbirth is a real human nature fear, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. it is a, it, you're like, wait, a actual human baby is coming out of my tiny vagina. Like what is happening? And I say tiny for because some. compared to a Lol. baby head, it is tiny. Lol. <laughs> but I say that like for, <laughs> I say vagina all the time. It's okay. But it's a Kirby enthusiasm joke. Um, oh, I never watched that show. You won't get it. Nope. Pretty, pretty, pretty. Big vagina. <laughs> um, but compared to a baby head, tiny, right? right? Yeah. So natural fear, very normal. I remember having a midwife appointment. I was extremely confident in my pregnancy. I tell all my clients, be super overconfident. That comes with education and informed consent, mm -hmm. but go into it winning attitude. Why would you do anything less, right? And there's no point. It doesn't serve your mental well-being. Um, but I remember going to my midwife and saying, she was like, how are you doing emotionally? We had like amazing meetings, hour-long appointments. And I was like, okay, I'm going to be honest. Um, I'm afraid of dying. And she was like, okay, you're a human. Normal. I was like, thank you for acknowledging that that is a normal emotion to feel and a normal fear to have i was like other than that i'm doing great i think i'm gonna rock it but i i'm afraid of dying and she's like okay thanks for sharing mm. it was awesome i just felt like very seen and heard and i like cringe <laughs> saying that yeah. but really but truly saying it out loud helps yes saying it out loud really helped and um i wasn't afraid of the pain i knew i could handle it i did have fear of pain the mm -hmm. moment I started crowning. I was like, no, 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 no. Like, I, like that's when I had the fear. The ring of fire. Yes, yeah. that's when I had fear. And it was moments of, I'm not ready to be a mom. Oh my God, I did this too young. I'm not ready. Oh my God, this hurts like hell. Make it stop, make it stop. I want the baby. It was, I mean, it was like life flashed before my eyes all in a split second, crazy thoughts. But I just kept going because I was, the baby was coming out, yeah, you, you know? To. And I'm like, okay, I'm glad the fear kicked in at the last moment because I had no other option, right? In America, we have a really bad association and relationship with pain. Yeah. We want to take people's pain away. We don't want people to suffer. We think suffering is bad. We think pain is something we should manage and typically – Previous to childbirth, if you have a pain, it's a car accident, broken bone, I cut my finger off, yeah. you know, like all the things you would never want to go through again, right? And that's the only association we have with pain is like an injury. Mm -hmm. We don't have positive associations with pain. I mean, not to get biblical here, but like the story of Jesus is interesting. I reflect on that sometimes because it's like suffering is life. Yes. How do you make meaning out of life and suffering? Because life is suffering. It doesn't mean your life has to be about suffering, but it's overcoming any suffering. I mean, I've never met anyone who hasn't suffered in their life. Suffering yeah. is the only thing that we are all guaranteed in life. Yeah. So you have to find joy and peace and happiness and love anyway, right? Well, it's the same with birth. It's painful, but it's not like... Is it euphoric after? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Like, it's... It's pain with a purpose, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And we don't have that in America because we live in a world and country that is run by money. Mm -hmm. I can take your pain away. Don't you want that? And we grew up with boomer parents who love drugs. Let's be honest, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe that's just me, but <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably, my parents are not addicted table. to drugs. Right, but yeah. I grew up in 
a medicalized house where we had Tylenol and cough medicine and all of the things to make you feel better, right? Yeah. Well, I think also to your point about pain is that what we've been taught is that pain is something bad that needs to go away. It's not yes. a signal that tells you something about your body. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It, and so that I do a lot of work in my prenatal class where we talk about downregulating your nervous system and your ability to um, basically assess your pain in the moment, right? And not move into a fight or flight or stress state or panic or shutdown, you know? And these women who have had traumatic births, they had moments, I'm sure, of shutdown. Much of their birth was in fight or flight or stressed out because they're like, wait, what is happening to me? What's going on? Like, no one's telling me anything, but oh my gosh, my baby's heart rate's dropping. Yes, cut me open now. And then they reflect and they're like, well, that was a shit show, you know, and there's yeah. no taking it back. Mm. So if you want to claim your birth before that happens, know that as soon as you cross the threshold of a hospital, you're on their watch. Yeah. They don't really care. Now, individuals care. Your doctor, wonderful. Your nurses, we're wonderful. Individuals do care. I really believe that to my core. I don't think doctors are malintended. As a systemic, you know, as a part of the system, they don't care about you. The out the true end goal of hospital births, and this is for real, is live mom, live baby. Important. Right. We want that, obviously. Mm -hmm. But uh I think we can do a little bit better. So what about Talk about how much more money that doctors and nurses make when it comes to induction, <clears throat> epidural, C section. Yeah, because, I'm very curious about that. Yeah, because we know, we know, I hope we all know by now that when it, we're talking about mainstream medicine, even when we're talking about COVID, how much more money do the doctors make when they have to put you on a respirator? How much more money do they make when they give you remdesivir, right? There are all these incentives that, remember, human beings run on incentives. So there are incentives that doctors and nurses have to administer certain interventions to women in, in when it comes to pregnancy and birth. Yeah. So I, there is a number, right? I don't know what the number is, but doctors make like X amount more of money if they perform a C-section. Yeah. They make even more money <clears throat> if they administer an epidural. They make more, more money if they induce you. So it, it's, it is an industry that oh, people yeah. make a ton of money off of. And it's really important for moms to know this. Again, like you've said, and we'll repeat it again, we're not diminishing any mom's no. experiences. If you had, I had, I had a hospital. We can talk about my birth too. I had to have a hospital birth. I had to have an epidural. Yeah. Thank God that she, she came out vaginally and, and it worked out great, but it was not my plan right. at all because, you know, I was a high risk pregnancy and then her heart valve was thickened and we ended up having to induce. It was not, I ended up, Pitocin is the worst thing on the planet. Ever. I would not wish Pitocin on anyone on the planet. Again, so we're not diminishing any women's experiences, but it's really important to understand what goes on at these hospitals and what's in it for the doctors and how that relates to women's well-being because they have huge incentives to cut you open and pull your baby out. Yeah. So this is a funny story. I was at a birth and it ended up being um, like a 50 hour. So I was at the hospital for like three days. Um, and it was a really close friend of mine. Gosh. And it was far from my house. It was in Newport Beach and I lived in West LA. And um, I had either had a really intense training day the day before. My neck was bothering me. You'll see me stretch my neck a lot. I've had like just neck issues, right? So Saw that. Yeah. So the nurse comes in and I was like, hey, can I have a Tylenol? She's like, uh, um, well, you don't have a wristband and it'd be like 80 bucks. You should just go to CVS. I was like, you literally can't just go get me a Tylenol. Like, 80, 80 aren't, bucks. Aren't I at a hospital? That's reasonable. I think you made it worse. <laughs> um, it's like, it, yeah, it's just like a little, sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Is, no. Do you see oh, what I'm talking see. about? Let me fix it. Fix it. Just happy we just do a podcast with the girls. Here. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So that cracked me up. I was like, okay, I'll just go across the street and go to CVS or wherever. I was like, typical, right? First of all, this nurse was just like, I've never been asked this before. I'm like, you literally can't just go, can you get one from your purse? Like, She was like, I know you have some. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I don't know numbers because I want to say every hospital is pretty different, you know, roughly the same. Yes. But it's all about insurance companies, okay? Yeah. So the insurance companies run everything. And it's so funny to me when I hear women come to me and they're like, oh my gosh, my midwife is $6,000. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. 
it's it's a lot of money. Well, that sounds awesome compared to a hospital stay. That's what I'm saying, right? Yeah. I say, okay, well, let's talk about the alternative. Does your insurance cover everything? I had this conversation with a woman the other day. She's like, okay, I I got my husband on board, like for the birth center, like the the cost is a little much. Like our insurance is really good. I said, well, what'd you pay out of pocket for your, your C section last time? She, I couldn't remember what she said, but I was like, well, have you called your insurance company and asked them if they cover midwifery? No, I was like, please call them. And she calls me back. She's like, oh my gosh, they cover birth centers. And I was like, boom. So first of all, insurance companies are starting to cover midwifery and birth centers. So mm-hmm. ask your insurance company. Midwifery. Midwifery. Yeah. I think that's such a funny word. Um, we have Sounds something like called we have something called Liberty Health Share, <laughs> which is a like religious health ministry. Um, it's kind of like a loophole to the insurance mm. scam. Um, there's lots of those that exist. Oh yeah, it's like it's <clears throat> Christian group, Ministries, of... Samaritan, Liberty Health Share. There's a couple of things. Yeah. So we've been doing that for like over f- five years now, maybe for all insurance, all of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Actually, we had dual at this until my son was born because it was a disaster. I hate insurance companies, um, but really, insurance companies dictate the price, right? I mean, to a degree, because the insurance companies will just tell the hospitals what they will get back if they charge X amount of price. X amount of dollars for right. a, um, a service, okay, whatever. Yeah. Um, literally everything that happens in a birth is scanned for and marked down and billed. So obviously the days are in the room, your epidural, your Pitocin, if they give you Advil, Tylenol, Motrin, yeah. um, a freaking heat pad, I don't know, probably. everything. Um, literally everything they bill. Is that why in that episode of The Office, Pam's like, I don't want to be here for like over a certain no, amount yeah. of time. She didn't want to go to the hospital until after midnight because right, they get yeah. only two days. Right, exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which real. That's real. Yeah. Right. So um you have like my husband, for example, had carpal tunnel surgery and they built an obscene amount of money just so the doctors could get this amount of money back. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing for every everything. Um, so I always say to women, like, well, do you know how much you would pay out of pocket for an unmedicated hospital birth? Okay. Unmedicated. Unmedicated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if unmedicated, it would be this. Okay. What about when you get your epidural? Oh, it would be this. Or oh, what about if you have a C-section? Right. $30,000? Jeez. Like, what if you have bad insurance? Right. Wouldn't you rather just pay that six grand? Yeah. Over time, not in one lump sum. See, and that's the difference with midwives is they tell you their price up front. And they say, our fee is $6,500. And that includes X, 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 and X. This Some may include an ultrasound. And like my midwives, it didn't include an ultrasound I had because they didn't have an ultrasound right. machine. They're like, you got to go somewhere else to get your 20-week. And I said, okay. I paid out of pocket for that too. Um, and we did bill our health share, especially with Siobhan when we didn't have the traditional insurance company. They paid a 100%. And those, um, it was awesome. I knew the upfront cost. My midwives said, just bring a minimum of $300 to every appointment. And then we want the lump sum paid by 36 weeks. And some midwives will let you pay, right. you know, however you need or little sliding scales. Or, like, midwives are really wonderful in that they really try to work with you. Um, and I love knowing the cost upfront because. You could go to the hospital, think you have great insurance, and then all this shit happens, and you get a bill back for ten thousand dollars, and you're like, "Oh my god, yeah. what if I had just paid the sixty five? Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. But in in the case of you 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 pay the sixty five hundred for the midwife, and but then you, then you have to go, to, yeah, and then you have to transfer. What happens there? That's a thing, and you know what? That is um, an unfortunate financial situation, right? Most of the time, yeah. Um, but we have 89% of births completed at home, your chances of you being in that 89% are higher, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's like, I would bet on that over a potentially financially yeah. unfortunate situation. Well, I think every woman just wants to have the baby out healthy. I, I don't think Absolutely. they're really preoccupied with money. at, at the, Usually it's after. At that point. They, yeah. yeah. Right, right. right. Yeah, at the, in the moment you transfer, absolutely. Right. Yes, of course. Okay. And it's, You're not thinking about money. No. It's and, uh, and, the last thing you're You know, it, it is, it can be, obviously we know that medical bills destroy people's lives. Yeah. So it, it can be financially devastating, but I, I really think those um, health, alternative health share are in your best interest because they really do cover catastrophic and they cover, they would cover most oh, of it. I mean, it would be a headache still, right. but- um, to have, I mean, 
if you had good insurance, I would still pay for midwives up front, even if they weren't covered in the case of a transfer, because then maybe the hospital would be covered. Right. You know? Oh, interesting. Um, like, I would always bet money on midwives. Hmm. I would put my money on midwives 100% of the time. So uh, here's a question. And somebody asked this too. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about epidurals. Yeah. Why... Why would a woman want to avoid an epidural? We've talked about this many yeah. times before, but uh, uh, like that example that I used mm-hmm. earlier, women like, well, if you're going to go get your tooth pulled out, why don't you just have pain medication? So I think the way that we are taught about epidurals, it's just like a shot. It's just like it numbs you and that's it. Yeah. So let's talk about why so many women want to avoid pain medication. What mm-hmm. are the risks? What comes along Great with question. that? Why, why would you want to be unmedicated? Great question. Um, so first of all, it's a spinal tap. Mm-hmm. So just so you know, it's a it's a nerve block in your spine. Um, some women have no problem with that. Me, I'm like hell no, nah. you know. And Carly got it; she was fine. I, and and most women are fine. Yeah, it's yeah. fine when you get it. It's just when when it, when it's explained to you oh, where yeah. exactly oh. it goes. It was gnarly. gnarly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. And when you see like, because before when I was still pregnant, my my like doctor explained to me. Yeah. He explained to me where it goes in the spinal next to the spinal cord and how small the margin of error is because yes. i asked him and it's he, extremely he, small because he he told me he was like i want you to know he's like i want you to know what it is he's that's most, great he's a lot of my women get epidurals he's like but if you're curious i'm going to tell you he drew it on a piece of paper wow. and i was like i don't want that shit in my spine totally you know what i mean yeah. and, but, and then he told me the risks and he told me the b- benefits or yeah. whatever but so anyway continue yeah no so it's a spinal block um i had an anesthesiologist who used to go to my gym and she was like it's my least favorite i hate doing it because it is oh, they gotta do very nerve-wracking okay. for a lot of anesthesiologists because the margin of error is very small um now ex- anesthesiologists are highly trained and you know I actually think anesthesiologists are pretty chill um, for the most part. The ones I met. You probably have to be. Yeah, yeah right? Was, the guy who did mine was like this. I mean, calm, cool, and collected. Totally. They yes. have like, to be. Yeah. Chill guy with glasses. His name was Paul. I'll never yeah. forget him. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> could I have been dream- Sidebar, could I have been dreaming this, but I remember when I got my wisdom teeth done. Uh-huh. I remember this totally could have been a dream. I could have been making it up, but I swear to God, I woke up during it, looked up, and I heard him say, Look who's up. Got to give him a little bit more. And then, and then <laughs> I swear to God, I didn't feel anything, obviously, but he's like, oh, he's up. Maybe. Yeah. Crank it up. <laughs> yeah, that's essentially what happened. Yeah. Oh, weird. I wonder, I wonder how many anesthesiologists are the targets of malpractice or wonder if that's mainly for the surgeons and Ooh, stuff like that. Great question. Yeah. But anyway, sorry. Know. Anesthesiologists no, are cool. Yeah. So they don't like doing this. Are they? An epidural is a nerve block. And here for me is the biggest issue I have with epidurals. Um, two. One, most of them are come with fentanyl and women are not told that there is fentanyl. Yes. And the fentanyl is in the IV. Oh, really? Yes. Mm. And the fentanyl takes the edge off. And if I am incorrectly explaining this, I am not a doctor. <laughs> um, but I just learned that like last year. Wow. And I'm like, wait, what? How did I not know this? And I posted about it on my Instagram and I have a friend. Well, we're not really friends. But we grew up together. I'm an anesthesiologist. You can always ask for no fentanyl. I'm like, does anyone know that? Does anyone know that? Right. I didn't. I should yeah. have known that. No, I, By I the way, doctor, <laughs> I'd rather a no fentanyl IV. Yeah. If you can. So fentanyl is an opioid. And why would anyone put that into your bloodstream when there's a child in your body? Right. When they tell you to not do drugs. Yeah. When you are pregnant. Yeah. They say you can't drink alcohol or. Yeah. Yeah. It's like. But like, let's a little just bit put, of fentanyl is okay. And it, it crosses fine. the placenta. Right. It gets into your baby's bloodstream. Like, Whoa. yeah. Yeah. So I have a huge problem with that. Yeah. No informed consent there. The other issue I have is that most women, because we have a negative association with pain in America, go to the hospital too early. No judgment on them. I get it. It's natural. They're in pain. They're like, how could it possibly be any worse than this? And you're like, I hate to break it to you. (laughs) It's going to get a lot worse than this. Um, That's what a doula is for, to be like, let's just go on a walk outside. We don't need to go to the hospital yet, right? Um, So they go to the hospital too early. They're like, I can't take it. Of course, when you get to the hospital, everything's heightened because people are poking you, prodding you, asking you a million questions and seeing their fingers up your vagina and um, you're feeling observed and there's lights on, they're fluorescent and you're just, it's not a comfortable space. So pain is heightened. It's very sterile. Yeah. And naturally, of course, you are like in a non-chill place Yeah. unless you are um, like a kung fu master and- uh, they get the epidural too early. Mm-hmm. Oh. And then once the epidural is in, it cannot come out until your baby is born. So you get your epidural super early. And then they say you cannot eat and all you can drink is water and clear liquids. And 
water and clear liquids like broth or tea oh, okay. then, like water or vodka like that's pretty much it <laughs> like like broth or tea like yeah gotcha um i don't even think they really want you to be drinking juice this is after the birth too after the epidural no just oh, after the epidural okay, in labor gotcha. but after the epidural so they tell you no food and the reason why they tell you no food is because if you have to get a c-section they want you to be fasted so let's think about this your uterus is a muscle your body has muscles that need to be energized and working and your brain needs to be on and they're going to not feed you. So what happens when you don't get food over a 30 hour period? What ha- what happens? You're exhausted as hell. And then you your uterus is a muscle. Your uterus runs out oh, of stamina. Oh, and that's when they introduce the C-section idea. That is when they say you're failing to progress. Oh we need God. to do a C-section. Wait, so this is why they tell you you're not supposed to eat Because labor? they are preparing your body for, for a, a C-section. potential C-section. Isn't that's that the only reason. That is the that only crazy, reason. And even not as a doctor, you know that like, swear that's to for God. sure. Yes. I know. I know. It it's is insane. okay. Insane. What, what what would someone what would someone, so when I'm a doula, I bring all the snacks, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. What yeah. would the devil devil's advocate say to that? Would be like, oh well, that's actually not wholly true because I I I wouldn't know how to. The devil's advocate would say, well, if you had a C-section and you threw up and asphyxiated, you could die. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you could. But, but let's try to not have a C-section. If you have a C-section, <laughs> and that's if you throw up. So not every person who, let's say, eats, has a C-section, is going to throw up, asphyxiate, and Correct. die. Correct. I've never seen it. There are also medical professionals in there during the C-section. So Trained you would surgeons. Think that, you would think that if you did throw up, people would be like, uh, you know. Yeah, fix, but like, standard protocol is pre-surgery, you they don't can't, eat. They can't, right, 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 right. So they wouldn't allow that in the first place. Right. Oh, interesting. So We learned a lot today. I want you all to know that if your doctor says no food, once you have an epidural, you say, gotcha, and you bring your food. Now, here's what I would do if I was having a hospital birth and the food I wanted to bring. I would get like baby food packets, like applesauce, orange juice, oranges, bananas, things that are soft and mushy and juicy right. and like um, sugary. Yeah. Not like a hot dog, you know? Right. <laughs> like that would be kind so, of like so a vaginal, pain in the ass so to eat. vaginal births and no epidural, it's okay to eat? Yes, I ate. I mean, I couldn't eat at a certain well, point because I wasn't keeping anything down. Right. So I was in active labor, but I, every midwife and doula encourages you food. up during your... During... Vomiting is very normal in labor when you're unmedicated, even when you're medicated. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, both. I vomited a lot. My doula wanted me to Pooping eat breakfast too. once she got there. I yeah. know that. I had a diarrhea. Yeah, yeah, and I knew I needed to eat, and I should have eaten when I was in early labor. You don't like that word? Yeah, I'm leaving, the, I'm leaving this episode. You guys care. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, she had, she's like, just try and eat an apple. I had this um, like goo stuff. It was like buttery balm. Um, I know and what you're I, about. I could I could eat that, and that was fine. And um, and she tried to get me to eat an apple. I threw up like five times immediately. She's like, all right, well, you're in active labor, I guess. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, so I highly encourage food eating. So I tell everyone, especially if you're having a hospital birth, eat a meal the moment you go into labor, even if it's 20 minutes after you just ate lunch or dinner. Yeah. Eat another meal and then eat a meal right before you get to the hospital. Really? Yes. You will need they that ask, energy. Will they ask the, the woman? They'll be like, have you no, eaten? They won't, no. They won't say anything. See, that's the dumbest thing ever, right? That is the dumb part. They're not, they don't care about what happens before you've entered the doors of the system. But once, once you're, you're on there, their watch, right. they have to do everything to cover their ass. So it's not like when you get in there, have your room and everything, you'd be like, okay, I'm going to have my little apple apple snacks and whatever. They're going to be like, no. Yeah, nothing. pretty we, much. We did that. It depends on the hospital. It does. And it, sometimes the nurses... Most, most cases, it is like that, where they'll come in and be like, no. But ours And sometimes there's really cool chill. nurses where they're like, no, no, you should like eat your yeah. Yeah. yogurt or whatever. Yeah, we brought two bags of snacks. Um. Do we ha- do we have a lot of questions, right? I feel like we do, lo- but I want to finish this. Oh yeah, finish this it. train of thought about an epidural. So talk a little bit yeah. more about why we talked about the fentanyl, yes. which crosses the placenta. Mm-hmm. Um, why else would a woman want to opt in for an unmedicated birth or not an epidural? You know, I really believe there is something so special about, and this is like the spiritual side of birth, like doing what your body is designed to do. And again, not shaming anyone for didn't, who didn't do it or no C-section or had a C-section. Um, it's just a mindset. I really think it is just a mindset of like, no, I don't need pain medication for something that is inherent to my being. Um, there are also after side effects, you know, 
you're not, you don't, some women who've had both say they felt much more euphoric after the unmedicated birth. The recovery is easier because you can move recovery right away. Is easier. Um, you can move right away. Oh, another reason why I wouldn't want an epidural um, is epidurals often stall labor, especially when you get it too early. When you get it later, like I had a client in January who had an epidural and she got it when she was very much in active labor and it didn't stall labor at all. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, but it can really stall labor. And then that leads to the cascade of intervention. Yes. Oh, labor stalling. Your contractions were six minutes apart, but now they're 10 minutes apart again. We should yeah. really start Pitocin. And then Pitocin is added and then baby's heart rate drops Yeah, because Pitocin is horrible. Mm -hmm. and it, hey, C-section time. So that's and then it's C-section oh, wow. time. The interventions just pile upon each yes. other. Epidural leads to a cascade of interventions. Yeah. 100%. Um, women can sometimes have pain at the injection site postpartum. Mm -hmm. If you do have that, go to a chiropractor. Um, you can have a spinal headache. Yes. You could have headaches. Um, baby feeling loopy, post or seemingly loopy after, likely from the fentanyl. Um, it's just it's just like... it's. Look, I, we'll say this. It's a lot more than just getting numb. Yeah. It's and a lot more than that. I get why people get it. Of course, of course, you're you're in a setting where it's not conducive to chill, 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 safe vibes. Not always. Most of the time. Um, so, yeah, numbing that pain. Amazing. <laughs> like especially um, if you had Pitocin, especially if you've had Pitocin. Yes. My contraction. Do, do you was... feel do you feel any anything from the Pitocin physically? Or is that like just now? The baby? No, no, oh, no, no, no. Like what, as, during the labor, yeah. my contractions were they're extreme. 40 minutes long, four zero. What? I'm not kidding, you guys. I'm not kidding. My doula came up to me and she said, and she promised me before I went into to labor, she says, honey, I will only, I will only suggest an epidural to you if I watch you suffering for yeah. no reason. Yeah. She says, because she's done, my doula did over 80 births. She was like in her 50s, has four kids. I just immediately trusted her. Mm -hmm. And I was so stubborn because I really, really wanted to have a natural birth. But like are we, so a little bit of, I don't know if I ever told my, my birth story, but I had to get induced yeah, because my together. daughter's heart valve was like, was very, it was, it was thickened, mm -hmm. which a couple of my friends have a theory that the vaccine shedding, because like any, any sort of heart enlargement mm -hmm. is um, what's myocarditis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are, there's talk of like, even the vaccine shedding can affect the right. Wait, what do you mean? So, so if someone has a vaccine and sheds on you, it could you could. Oh, have you're not talking effects. about yourself, obviously. Right. You're not no, talking no, no, about no. yourself. Like someone <laughs> shedding. Just like hang on. A second. Yeah. Someone <laughs> shedding when I was pregnant. Right. Oh, yeah. And obviously weird. the baby's much smaller than I am, so it could have gone. Anyway, that's a theory. Who knows? But her heart valve was thickened to the point where, um, like even my OB was really nervous. So I, uh, being a high risk pregnancy, I had to go to an MFM, which is a maternal fetal medicine doctor. It's mm -hmm. a specialist OB. And I had to go to a general OB. My general OB and I would kind of like kind of sit and laugh at how uh, like panic inducing mm -hmm. the MFM was. Like every time I, your baby's really big. Your, your baby's <laughs> very, very large. But my, my and I would go see my general OB. We would kind of laugh. And he'd be like, look, it's their job to panic. It's yeah. their job to freak you out. He yes. was like, we'll take everything they say with a grain of salt. Cool. But when they did the ultrasounds and found that this heart valve was thickened, my OB called me and he was like, you know, I will never force you to do anything. Yeah. He said, but I'm going to tell you right now. He's like looking at the literature, the rates of stillbirth really go up and you being high risk because of your history with blood clots. He was like, if you were my wife, I would induce you tomorrow. And I was, I mean, I call my, I was, I was freaking out because yeah. my mom had just been admitted to the ICU the day before. We were like in crisis mode already yeah. in my house. And I sat and I was like, I called I called Pastor Michael mm -hmm. and he and he and his wife prayed for me on the phone because I didn't know what to do because mm -hmm. I, I how many times did we talk on the phone yeah. I didn't want to be induced mm -hmm. I didn't I, I wanted to go as natural as possible and I knew that the I would have so much of a higher risk of having a C section if I were induced and I think I even totally. left you a voice note like in a panic yes. yeah and and my doctor he said <laughs> he says you take take a couple hours to think about it he was like just call me. He was, like, he was like, I'm actually going to call you back later today. And I thought about it and I was like, I would never forgive myself if something happened of to course. her. So I decided to get induced. Yeah. Right? Pitocin was the worst, sorry about my language, the worst fucking thing on the planet. My contractions were literally 30 to 40 minutes long. But the Pitocin and caused that. The Pitocin yes. caused that. Okay. I, it induces you're, contractions. You're in a time okay. warp when you're in labor, right? Yes. You're in a time warp. I don't know what time it is. I don't know what planet I'm on. My doula came to me. She said, honey. You just had a 37 minute contraction. <laughs> what and did I it feel like, like to you? Do you remember? I don't know. I was in hell. Yeah. I have no idea. And yeah. you know how like Pitocin, so for those of you who don't know, Pitocin, it 
manually forces your uterus to contract and it forces your body to do something it's not ready to do. Correct. My body, my baby was not ready to come out. I was 39, 38 weeks and set six days, like right before 39 weeks. She was not ready to come out. And my body was going into like spasm. My uterus was freaking out. 40 minute contractions. And my and I was so stubborn. And my husband was like, honey, it's time. Yeah. It's time, honey. She was like, you cannot do this to yourself. And I wasn't dilating. I was only, I was barely even one centimeter because my body was freaking out. Yeah. And she looked at me and she was like, and my husband has no idea what's going on. He's totally. just there. I'm, I'm nearly breaking his hand. I'm sitting on the toilet because that's like <laughs> often only like one of the best positions. places yeah. to be. And I'm like breaking his hand. I don't know what's going on. And I said, okay, it was like three in the morning. And so we called the nurse in and she was like, what do you want to do? I was like, oh, let's just do it. Yeah. So the anesthesiologist comes in, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Comes in. The epidural was it was fine. I just pushed the button once because mm-hmm. all my mom friends, they were like, if you if you get it, they were like, do not push the button more than once right. because you're gonna be loopy. You're not gonna mm-hmm. be able to walk after. A friend of mine said she pushed it once and within like 30 minutes after giving birth, she was able to walk. I was like, I want that. So I just pushed yeah. it once and everything went fine. And I fell asleep and my body went into rip roaring labor. Because and I was your nervous system was nervous able system, to relax. Yeah, yeah. And that's when epidurals are absolutely amazing exactly right what was my point of that my point is i don't even know what my point is my point is that like i want all of the moms or to be moms to understand what the potential risks are of yes. an epidural but i do also totally acknowledge that there are some cases where absolutely. sometimes you need it and even my ob told me when i was still pregnant he was like i've had several cases where the woman's body was just not going into labor mm-hmm. the way that like I wanted it to. She was stuck at three centimeters mm-hmm. di- dilated and she just like wouldn't dilate anymore. And oftentimes having the epidural to just like totally relax the body. Yeah. Next thing you know, in two hours, she's like 10 centimeters. Yes. And that's what happened to me. Yeah. It was like one thirty in the afternoon. <clears throat> he came in. He was like, can I check you? Let's see. He was like, okay. He was like, you're ready. You're 10 centimeters. I was like, yeah. Then he just what? had to rip the baby out of it. Yeah. Cause then she got body. shoulder dystocia, yeah. which is yeah. why that's why like <clears throat> my whole thing was if, if she had shoulder dystocia at home, yeah. Well, midwives are trained in that too. But yeah. Um, yeah, epidurals are amazing. They really are. There are risks to everything, but epidurals yeah. are amazing. There's a massive risk. And I and I'm so fortunate. Like after I recovered fairly quickly, I didn't have any pain at the injection spot, but epidurals are a really scary thing. Yeah. Like they they're are. scary. I don't even look at the needle anymore. Yeah, and like starting out with a home birth, you know, or intending to have a home birth and then having to transfer for exhaustion. Usually what happens is you transfer to the hospital because you're exhausted. Some women who are just, you know, want to stay the course unmedicated will like have an IV for fluids and it helps them a little bit or Mm -hmm. um, whatever. But typically you get an epidural, you go to sleep because you're so tired and your body relaxes and you- Yeah, so Carly was able to sleep. Yes, and you dilate because your nervous system is able to chill out and then- like this, the statistics I just read, the uh, vaginal rate is still very high, even with transfers, um, because you know that once you get to the hospital, it's a medically necessary situation. Yeah. Like you're exhausted. Your body is tapped out and that's OK. But now we need to help you. And yeah. so like, of course, Pitocin is fucking crazy. It's so gnarly. It's the contractions so are insane. I mean, it's I've awful. never had it, but all I hear is like it's horrible. Because and it's yeah. not it's not the natural rhythm of no. labor. It it's, is like zero to 100 real fast. So real fast. do you know what causes the heart rate of the baby to drop during the Pitocin? Okay, yes, I do. It is because Pitocin is, they call it a uterotonic medication. So mm-hmm. it medically stimulates the uterus to contract. It squeezes so hard, so fast. Like uh, unmedicated labor gradually builds. Okay. So baby gets used to the contractions slowly. So is it almost like kind of like scaring them? Like yes, where it is. Heart- it is putting them into distress because it is, it is squeezing so hard so fast. Oh. Yes. Those poor babies. And some so OBs gross. who um, find that their time is more valuable than the woman's time, which those people are out there too, will just nudge. I've over, doulas have overheard OBs say to the anesthesiologist or the nurse, pit to distress. So they up the Pitocin purposely so that the baby just dist- goes into distress so they do a C-section and leave. That shit happens. What? Yes. They're like, we need to put your pit all the way up to 20. Like 20? To, to get your, um, to get these contractions going. Baby, you know, let's get it going. Of course, the woman's going to say, oh, okay. And then is, they- Is that- what on the level- And that is, not- I don't think that's super common. That That's like, that's like the, uh, the no. doctors who are- right. Over but, it, but on the overworked on, on the level of unethical, where is that? Uh, I would call that criminal. Really? Oh yeah. Up to distress. Pit to distress. Pit to distress. 
With all that's happening in the world right now, it's no wonder you're worried. Nobody knows what's going to happen. And that's why you need the certainty of gold and silver in your investments. Precious metals will keep you safe from inflation and financial turmoil. And this month, for every qualified IRA, you'll get an incredible 3-ounce silver American virtue coin, completely free, as a thank you. You know what to do. Call 877-646-5347 now to find out more. Visit noblegoldinvestments.com. I'm going to look up questions while you finish this. Okay, now well, we'll I have some. a philosophical question okay, before, you, before you get the question. Love that. And it has to do with abortion. Okay. Oh, and God. Because, no, well, because you're a mom, and I yeah. think I've asked you this. I think I've probably asked my wife this. If it was a question of your life or the baby's, I've always felt that most mothers would say, deliver my baby. Would you do that? Okay. That's a great question. My husband actually asked me this question while I was pregnant. He asked me hardcore questions yeah. in pregnancy. He's like, I need to know like what to do when right. if there is an emergency situation and I have to be the one to choose you or the baby. Do you know what I told him? I said, choose me. Really? <laughs> yes, I did. When I was pregnant. Now, postpartum, I don't know if I'd say the same thing, but when I was pregnant, I was like, choose me. I can make another baby. Right. You know, and right, that was right, my right. rationale. I was like, if one of us isn't going to make it, pick me because we can make more. Yeah. You know? Um, and but you're saying like, post that you might not answer the same way though? Because because that that rationale actually makes sense. I don't. When I, think I, about I wouldn't it. consider that an abortion. So I would consider right, that right, a right. the abort the the abortion is the procedure to kill the baby. Yeah, purposefully. that's right. right. If you're in labor and there is a, a severe and dire emergency where I have to choose mom or baby, I told my husband, you "Better fucking choose me." Sorry. Really. That's what I said. Yes. Yeah. Am I being perfectly honest? And um, obviously. You know, I took a moment to think about it, but my rationale was I can make more babies, hopefully. Right, right. You know, if they take out my uterus, then we're screwed. Um, I would just assume that those procedures are, okay, we have to get the baby out. I mean, and right, that's to save, like a- To save the mom's life, it's like, take the baby out. There's something going on here. And if the baby happens to die during that procedure, I think that's just what happens, right? There's no doctor who's like, we have to kill this baby then take it out because no, this no. is like super I think those late situations are like about. car accidents or like right exactly like, yeah. like true trauma emergencies right right um i'm not talking about like two months mortality in to or like the to the pregnancy maternal and infant death are often like um well we have stillborn births and right right you know of course there's a whole host of anything or mostly unknown things like internal bleeding and stuff like that that Things just happen. I couldn't right? speak on stillborn births. I don't do a lot of okay. um, reading into that. But um, have you ever been there for one of those? I have not. Okay. No, but I have known. Yeah, yeah. I have known some midwives and doulas who have. Um, but a lot of the maternal deaths are postpartum, post C-section. Really? They're medically related. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so you wouldn't likely ever have to make that choice. What do they call the the maternal death? Now, what are the deaths of the babies? Infant. Called? Infant. The mortality. Infant yeah. Yeah. Infant mortality. Um, Why does? But so, yeah, that was my answer to that question. Yeah. Now postpartum, I don't. I would probably say choose my child. Yeah. Because you know, as a mom, you know, obviously you want to live and see your children live and selfishly, but as a mom, you're also like. I did the thing that I came to on yeah. earth to do and yeah. now it's I have to let the kids go. Peace out. And you know, it's it's your time. Okay. So now I would probably choose my kids. Here's another I had another idea while you were still uh, looking at questions. Uh infant mortality rate you mentioned in the US is higher than in any other like let's say first world country like European country or something, right? I like, believe so. Okay. I don't know it exactly. It's up there. Okay, the statistic that I always hear too is that black mothers have a okay. higher rate of mm -hmm. infant death and maternal, maternal death, death in America. Yeah. Do you know why that is? Let me just oh. jump in really quick and just yeah. say that <clears throat> it's really important to understand, unfortunately, that African-American black women ha are, are much more unhealthy than other ethnicities in America. So This is just on the whole? On the whole. So those two are certainly connected. Okay. Yeah. There's just no way that they're not correlated. So, that so those be, are one, one of the reasons that's you That's one of the reasons. I believe okay. that would be one of the reasons. Um, Because uh, there's the, always a the thing you hear where like, we're not, the, the, they're not heard in the same way as let's say like yeah, an they Asian use, woman or a white they woman. They use like the know. Serena Williams example. Have yeah. you heard about her birth? Mm -hmm. No. So she had, she had a history of blood clots like I did. Mm -hmm. And um, after she gave birth, she had this strong intuition. We were talking about intuition. Yeah. 
She had the strong intuition that something was wrong. Mm-hmm. With her. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Her baby was fine, but she had a very strong intuition that she was clotting. Yeah. And the nurse literally said to her, I mean, she said, the nurse said to her, honey, I think you're just really loopy from the medication because she ended up having to have a C-section. Mm-hmm. Right. And Serena pushed and pushed and pushed and it turned out that she had like a serious clot. Yeah. Oh, really? And yeah. that the doctors and nurses like weren't listening to her. Yes. So that is an example that they use. Of course, they twist that to say it's because she's black. Mm-hmm. Right. There but is like a you history just said about of the pit to distress, yes. like of people just being like, "Yeah, you're probably, you're, yeah, yeah, it's probably the medication." But. So the father of gynecology, I don't know his name, um, but he was like definitely a known racist and would experiment in America. A, in America, experiment on black women. J. Marion Sims. Okay, and <laughs> that may be it. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know for sure. I don't know. Is, is it for sure? Like, I, I don't. I don't. Most likely. Yeah. Um. But, you know, black women were perform like had medical um, things done to them without anesthesia. And that was just like, you know, in the time back then, you know, yeah. black people don't feel pain. And so people use that example to say that the entire medical system is right. it is because of systemic racism, right. systemic racism. OK, um, just like I said, I believe that most doctors aren't inherently malintended. I don't believe most doctors are racist. Right. Right. I, I don't believe that. Yeah. Um, How dare you with your <laughs> white fragility. <laughs> yeah, you hippie. <laughs> um, so sorry if that is offensive. Yeah. I think that's I think that's um a wonderful quality of mine that I don't think humans are inherently racist. Yeah. Um and maybe that's because I'm white. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um but again, like I don't believe most doctors are inherently malintended. I don't yeah. believe most doctors are racist. Is there a history of racism in gynecology? Yes. Does that mean that black women are dying because of that? I don't think so. It's probably not a good statistic of the um, unhealthiness asso- associated with a particular group of people. So then they try to cover that up by saying, "Oh, it's probably racism." And yeah. you have to then- you have to think of um, just societally. Like, I don't know if all of the black maternal death happens in inner cities and low income places. I would assume so. And then I would I would um, question the hospital. Mm-hmm. That was my next point. Like, how many patients do you have? What's yeah. your volume? Right. Like, yeah. why are you ignoring people? It's, I don't think they're ignoring black people. I think most of their patients are black. Are black exactly? Right. And then they're they're overworked. They have too too high volume. OBs suck sometimes, <laughs> and shit happens. Yeah. Um, yes, people get ignored in the hospitals. Um, yes, wealthier cities have more attentive care. Right. So it's really an access thing. Um, yeah. I agree with that. And, and okay, do I believe that uh, anyone in the inner, c- inner city can have the awakening to be like, okay, literally everyone I know has had a terrible experience in the hospital. Why would I go there? Yes, I do. Right. Most people are sheep and they follow. Okay. Yeah. And that is another problem in America, which we're all trying to help mm. solve. Yeah. So we have 99% of women birthing in hospitals. That means all those deaths are happening because of hospital births. Yeah. Right? I don't believe there's any racial disparity among home birth um, outcomes. Yeah. Right. Oh. I don't think, I mean, home birth is not sense. a rich white woman thing. Right. There. I mean, I follow so many black doula accounts. I love them. I follow some too. Oh, they're really interesting. They're really interesting. And I'm all for like black people fighting the system and fighting them like i have no problem bringing race into certain things when it's black women advocating for their community to rise up and you know step out of an oppressive system the medical system is an oppressive system it's not inherently racist i don't believe i think everyone it's just overall it's an oppressive overall system. Yeah. and we have 99 percent of american that. women yeah. birthing hospitals so uh, hell yeah support yes. your community exactly. you know yeah. i know like i love those accounts and Home birth is not a rich white well, that's person. That's why they thing. demonize home births, right? Because they want to have keep women coming into the hospital. Yes, that makes so much sense. And now. they want you to think it's a rich white person thing. I never thought of it. I always thought of that's it like good. a hippie thing. I that's always, good. No, but I, you know, I think that they do really paint it as a rich white. They paint it as. Like I always a thought the rich white woman would have the suite in the hotel and there's in, that the, in the hospital. Absolutely. You know what I mean? like, but like Hillary Duff was kind of mm-hmm. was kind of famous for doing her last birth as a home birth and who. Hillary Duff? That's yeah. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, come on, yeah. Disney. Come on. Lizzie McGuire. Um, here's a question. Let's get into these. You yeah. have, I, this might be a record. When I checked this morning, she had 40 questions for her. And okay. I think we've gotten more since because I think so many women find this topic very interesting. Well, mm-hmm. I think who got who got the thing with all the, oh, Sav. 
Remember Sav just got the one guy the that one kept guy. on asking questions. <laughs> that guy is not present here. Um, what are your thoughts on the due date formula? Oh. Yeah, because we mentioned that briefly earlier. You know what? Um, I'm not into it personally. What's so, the formula? Okay, the formula is yeah. your due date is based off the first day of your last period. Okay. So you're not even pregnant for two weeks. Right. 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 I think that's, that's so how bizarre. The, it's so weird. So my husband was like, you're 12 weeks, but you're really 10 weeks. Gotcha. I'm like, right. yeah, I've had a baby inside of me for 10 weeks, but I'm 12 weeks. Oh, so that's why sometimes people who are overdue, there's no cause to panic because exactly oh, okay gotcha right so oh. it's a you should as women we should really know when we ovulate yeah women come on women duh it's really easy it's re actually it takes it's really easy. about a moment of effort it takes about one month of effort what do you yeah. gotta do you track your cycle so you track your period mm -hmm. and usually women have between five and seven days some four some seven, mostly around five. I'm around five. I'm around three or four. And um, <laughs> and then there are different ways to test when you're ovulate. You're gonna love this word. Ovulate. You mm. check your cervical mucus. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> are you so glad we did this episode, yeah. Mike? Yeah. This is extremely important. Like why I didn't learn this in seventh grade biology blows my mind. I know. Why would they teach you that? Why why don't they teach why don't they do that? They just they teach you how to put a always, condom no, on a banana. They always talk about teaching you how to, you know, be transsexual, but they don't teach you. I mean, yeah. do they? You know why? Because Big Pharma writes the textbooks at medical school. And they want you to be on birth control. And they literally, this is, guys, you know what they teach in medical school? I've had four separate students in medical school message me over the last several months and say, at medical school, they teach you <laughs> that a woman can get pregnant on any day that she's not menstruating. Like, are you kidding me? Wrong. Isn't that insane? They actually you teach soon-to-be no. doctors that you can get knocked up on any day that you're not that, that you're menstruating, not on your that you're not on your period. Yeah, but, but I always said there's like a, a good window. There is. Right. So that's when you're ovulating. Yes. Right? So the, you, an egg only lasts for about 24 hours, right. but sperm can live in cervical mucus for five to six days. Right. Okay, yeah, so when exactly. you have yeah. more cervical mucus, if you have sex, even when you're not ovulating right. yet, the sperm can live in the mucus. Okay, gotcha. I'm going to say mucus a lot. That's okay. Um, but... So you can also take your temperature. The way I like to know when I'm ovulating is I get the clear blue ovulation sticks. They're so expensive. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's so dumb. How much are they? It's like fifty dollars for how many sticks? Like ten. Oh, okay. It's a kind of annoyingly expensive. How many in do my you opinion. use a month? Um, probably not ten, but still, I, I okay. I'm just pissed about spending fifty dollars on something like sure. that. But whatever. Yeah, it's pointless. It works. You can test. You do a P sticks. They're like pregnancy tests and yeah. they tell you when you're ovulating. Okay. Then once you know you're not ovulating anymore, you are in infertile. In the right. clear. In the clear. Right. Um, so to go back to the question on due dates, um, knowing when you ovulate and if you had sex in that fertile window, that is a much more accurate due date. Um but yeah, the way they do it is from the first day of your last period, which is so dumb. I always thought that was really Still, how come they don't update it's that? It's the most accurate way because most women know when they have their period, they don't know when they ovulated. Gotcha. Yeah, okay, that, that's got, why they okay, do it. All yeah. Right, sure. <clears throat> okay, so um, here's a kind of an odd question How early should women plan to have babies? How early should women planning to have babies stop their vegan diet? Oh, that's a great question. That's a good question. Um, I would say at least a year. Wow. Wait, <laughs> why? Well, when you are um, not eating animal proteins and fats, you are lacking in essential nutrients for fetal brain development, fetal organ development. Now, I'm not saying vegans can't have perfectly healthy babies. They right, do right. all the time. I'm from LA. Yes. And they're like, how dare you? <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, like I believe that you're doing all the things right. Like, right. To have a nutrient dense vegan diet that is supportive of fetal development and maintaining it's mother's difficult. health, it yeah. is like you're eating like four cups of alfalfa sprouts a day and seven cups of broccoli and all this other shit. Yeah, and it's like cool if and you then can supplementing on top of that, and then supplementing on top of that. Um, I, you know, um, I have a difficult time with being kind about veganism and people not getting upset about it. Um, but cause I'm not going to tell anyone what they should or shouldn't do, but at the same time, the data is out there that animal fats and animal proteins is essential for fetal development and 
mom's collagen supply, blood supply, tissue, de- good tissue for strength, good for placenta, good for muscle development. Um, again, you can do it on a vegan diet. It is extremely e- extreme effort. Well, and that being said, yeah. we have people who are eating McDonald's and Chick-fil-A for their whole pregnancy. Right. So it's like, where's the where's the line? So question on this. Okay. I understand people, what about vegans who are vegan due to ethical reasons and not diet reasons? Like that's got to be a little bit tougher for... They, I would assume those were the ones that would stay on a vegan diet anyway. Yes. The ones um, who are just doing it for dietary purposes are like, oh, okay, yeah, I can quit it. I would say, then- do you know how many animals die to make your bread? I was just going to say. Do you oh, know I know. How- no, I know. So I, I, um, I'm not going to shit on anyone's ethics because who am I to judge right. what you believe in? Yeah. But at the same time, there is no consumption without death. Right. I was just saying from the point of view of someone who does it for sure. ethical purposes. I would still Right. I, I would say like I don't care. Yeah. I I don't think that that is more important than your child. If you care about animals over your child, well, I would question your ethics in a in a very literally like very spiritual way. Right. I am not saying like you're an idiot. I'm not because I understand animal ethics. I love animals. Yeah. I love cows. I like I literally say hello to the cows as I drive by them at my house every time I'm like hey cow I'm sorry I eat you <laughs> but I know that there are cycles of life yeah if you are revering animals over your human child and that is the only reason you are a vegan I would question well, no, your no, no, desire this, to have well, a child. Also, right, it's, this, not, it's not more ethical to be vegan. Is also the no, thing. no, no, it's no. I'm, t- I'm talking about. I'm just vegans in general don't who aren't pregnant, right? Aren't thinking about like their child, but if, no. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So that that's what I, that's I, the question I, is interesting. Well, it's not in that. I think this person knows that a vegan diet is not optimal right, for right, pregnancy. Right. Gotcha. So right. when should I start optimizing my body to prepare for? A growing baby. Yeah. Right. I would give yourself. At I least just think a year. that like staunch like that. vegans would be like, nothing's going to change what I'm doing. I'll supplement. I'll do whatever I can. But someone who's probably, I would say, maybe I would like actually fad dieting would probably be like, okay, this diet seems better for being pregnant. I have I'm- much more understanding for vegans who do it for health reasons because I'm like, oh, you just don't know yet, mm. and let me show you the light vegan ethical vegans are much more difficult but asking right. them that question what's what's more important to you your human baby or Their that cow, cow over there the cow baby fuck the that cow, cow. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> versus my that. baby yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly yeah so um yeah give yourself at least a year i like that this question this is sad i'm I'm 43, I have a three and a half year old and I've miscarried three times. Oh, I really geez. want one more help. Oh. I don't know why that really makes me emotional reading that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, <coughs> um, age matters on one hand and it doesn't matter on another hand, right? Someone just posted a really cool thing about um, more science out there saying that women can potentially grow more eggs, which we have never thought to be true. We've always thought women are born with all the eggs they'll ever have and there's new science to support maybe that's not actually the full story. Oh. That's all I'm going to say because that's literally all I know. I read wow. it on Instagram. Oh, yeah, my, Carly always says like, while I was in my mother's like womb, I already had like all the eggs. You sent yes. me that. Yeah, yes. that, You sent me yes. that when I was a little bit sad that I yes. found out my daughter was a girl, yes. not a boy. You sent me this really sweet picture that she has all the eggs. In and it, I actually right? cry when you sent me that because yeah. it was such a special thing. Yeah. 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 So to whoever asked that question, um, I'm so sorry that you're having miscarriages, multiple miscarriages. That is devastating. Um, and I would seek out functional medicine i would go to a functional medicine doctor or a naturopathic doctor who will do a lot more than your OBGYN will do when it mm-hmm. comes to your blood work and your diet and what is going on like my first thing would be like what's your diet like what are we eating are you eating processed foods are you eating junk food are you eating and i'm not assuming this of whoever asked this um are you eating fast food are you not eating meat are you not eating eggs are you not eating bacon are you not eating you know, are you not taking your supplements? Um, and again, if you're not doing all those things, you can still conceive. It's just if you are having trouble, I would start investigating. Mm. Um, and then checking sex hormones with the functional medicine doctor, progesterone. So um, oftentimes 
low progesterone can lead to a miscarriage because progesterone is what is necessary for implantation, basically keeping the pregnancy. Mm. So you could have a fertilization and get a positive pregnancy test. Like I had a chemical pregnancy, which is where I got a positive pregnancy test. But it was It's like a late period. So right. maybe conception occurred, but implantation didn't. But yeah. hormones were high enough where I got a positive pregnancy mm-hmm. test. Mm. Um, and uh, so I would find a functional medicine doctor and do not lose hope. Number yeah. one. I actually, whoever this is, I will DM you two recommendations for functional medicine doctors that um, do virtual work. Yeah. So that's, and one of them is also an Eastern medicine doctor and a functional well, that's medicine good. doctor. Take a picture of that because that's going to go away yeah. after a while. Screenshot. You can look at it in the archive, but I'll screenshot it. Oh, you can? Oh, yeah. Cool. Oh, I didn't know that. Um. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good thing to know if you ever want to go back and look at questions in the archive. <laughs> oh. Okay. Here's a good one. Are there Are there really exercises you can do to avoid tearing or lessen the degree of tearing? Oh, great question. Um. <clears throat> Um, yes and no. I would eat collagen, have a high collagen diet, mm. and that is animal collagen. Mm. So like helps like, you know, if you eat organs, if you eat animal organs, uh, like helps like. So if you're eating collagen, I do it. I, I mean, I have collagen every day. Um, but your tissues and your ligaments need collagen to remain supple. So Go, I'll go on Amazon, order some collagen, and uh, I'll send you a link for collagen. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll send some good ones to you that you can post in the show notes if you want. Um, but okay. anyway, collagen is super necessary. Maybe high that's why high care. fat diet is, is really necessary. No collagen companies sponsor the show. <laughs> yeah, for real. Um, high fat diet, really good. So if you don't eat animals, you are eating a shitload of avocado. avocados, coconut, um, olive oil, almond butter. Oh no! I would. Is that a sugar? And uh, I mean, if you're gonna do it, I would. I would probably find fattier things than peanut butter. almonds. Um, maybe like cashews and macadamia Cashew nuts. Butter. Oh man, I love macadamia. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, pelvic floor exercises. So I, like you said, I'm a birth fit coach. We, I used to teach the birth fit seminars. Um, we teach coaches how to coach prenatal and postpartum women, and uh, we have exercises you can go on youtube it's called the birth fit basics just exercises you can do they're literally very basic um to help strengthen and relax your pelvic floor i think what women think they need to do is make their pelvic floor stronger when in reality most women are probably too tight and they need to relax your pelvic floor so this is my number one advice for pregnant women and and pre pre conception when you pee when you sit on the toilet, Wait, you told me this one. Don't don't, don't look at me while you're. <laughs> Mike, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a secret. Because <laughs> um, it's like you're telling me to do like, Stop. it. Stop. Oh, okay. Don't push your pee out. Just let your body relax. <laughs> I say uh-huh. like. <laughs> don't look, at, don't look me. at me. That was that's a bigger laugh than the dog victim blaming. Uh, so this is the number one thing. I really believe this helps so much. Relax when you sit on the toilet. Don't push your pee out. Don't force it out. Just like you just had Thanksgiving dinner and Do you're you like, Do you guys Ugh. usually force your pee out anyway? Yeah, especially uh, if we're in a hurry. If we're trying really? to go fast. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so intentional pee, okay? Think of a waterfall. And if you know you have pelvic floor issues, go see a pelvic floor physical therapist. Mm. Are there physical therapists who just specialize in that? Yes. That's mm-hmm. all they do? You you know what's crazy about America and postpartum is that we don't have no standard of care for postpartum and women have major abdominal surgery, C-section or major uh, vaginal delivery and they just God. say see you later. Oh, yeah, gosh. My but when you have ACL surgery or literally C-section. any other surgery you get a prescription for physical therapy. Why don't we have that for your pelvic floor? Why don't we have a lot of things uh, concerning Great pregnancies, question. deliveries and stuff. But you always hear Europe is like the best place to deliver a baby. Yeah. Like the Nordic countries always have like So the you're best saying we should become care. socialist. No, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> um, okay, we're moving a little bit out of pregnancy. Thoughts about giving infants vaccines. Oh, oh, oh really? We're going there. Come on now. Yeah, let's go. Um, I'm not socialist. <laughs> <laughs> we Okay, this is really funny. My... We have two teenage neighbors and my husband heard them arguing. They're two teenage girls. Don't call me a Democrat. Don't call me a liberal. And my husband walks inside like laughing like, oh, my God. I was like, that is so funny. Um, Okay, vaccines. Let's freaking go there. Yeah. What about? Yeah. What are your thoughts on giving? um, Is it? Can I? Can I ask you? Did you give your kids? Did you give your kids? Oh, I'll share. So we vaccinated my son except for hepatitis V and hepatitis B. 
and a couple other ones because at the time I was really hesitant. I was really hesitant to vaccinate our son. Uh, my husband was not. He, um, but he understood that he, he heard my concern and was like, I'm going to research. Like, I was like, my vote is no. If you want to, like, we got to figure out a plan. Um, so, but it wasn't as strong of a no as I am now. It was like, I don't feel comfortable. I'd like to delay. You know, that's kind of where it was. <clears throat> and so he did a lot of research and he's like, you know what? Like, I'm learning so much about the gut response to medications. And I really think that antibiotics are a problem, like a huge, huge problem. Like we should huge. not give our kids antibiotics, like avoid at all costs. And I was like, oh, I've like never. Like Tylenol and stuff like that? No, like literally antibiotics. So oh, like, like if they get an ear infection yeah, or something, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so... I was like, okay. So we did a little more research. He's like, I, I'm learning about single dose vaccines that are preservative free and thimerosal free, mercury free. And I think that's the route we should go. They seem like the safest route and yada, yada, yada. And I put it on him to do the research because of my hesitancy, right? I was like, I know where I'm at. I need you to come back to me, right? So he came back to me here. Here's what I think we should do. And I was, I, I said, you know what? I'm okay with that because I didn't do any of the research. And um, and by the way, the research is not on Google, right. <laughs> if you're wondering. Yeah, no. Um, so we vaccinated our son. I knew we did not want to do hepatitis B. We were like, why would we give our son hepatitis B? Right, we don't, right. we don't have right, hepatitis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you stupid. And he's and, not going to be around needles And my soon. pediatrician's like, how did he go to daycare without a hep B shot? And I go, he just, they didn't he care. Just <laughs> we just told him he didn't have a hepatitis B. This woman's like, okay, just let me know when he gets it. We're like, okay. Um, but in California, it, you can't go to school if you are You live vaccinated. there. We lived there. Oh, okay. We moved to She's Texas. She's like from LA. I am from Los Angeles. Hey. Yeah. I'm cooler than both of you guys. I'm <laughs> Just so you know. I'm That's New York. I'm Kajams. No, she's a valley girl. Oh, yeah, true. But the character that she played was in New York. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that character. Yeah. Um, Kajams. So my son, uh, one of his first vaccines, the shrieking is unbearable, by the way. Have you guys vaccinated? She, I you don't so have to we, answer. No, we, we got, didn't do anything. We to did her at the. Did we do like a four month or six month one where she? I think only got. We, we have thus not. We're not doing it. Mm -hmm. We're not moving forward with it because I think after that initial one, we're like we're not going to do the. What's the one with like the? It's like they may get like diarrhea or something. Uh, Ro oh, oh, uh, rotavirus. Rota yeah, rotavirus. that's oral. Yeah, yeah. My wife was like, no. We yeah, no, we, we didn't that. do that. Don't either. do that. They'll um, scare you hard into that one. Yeah, yeah I think they that's what they were trying to do. Like, it. oh, so you're saying that she might get diarrhea? Like, cool. Like, my, yeah. my my pediatrician goes, we have one patient who's in the hospital right now. I was like, wow, that's great. Only one. Yeah, no, I know. Right? <laughs> I was like, okay, like babies fucking Enough get said. sick. For <laughs> <Yeah>. the info. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, okay. No, yeah, I think we just got. Um, she wasn't too bad with like the shaking and crying. It was actually pretty quick, but I think I can't remember what it was. I'll get back to. I'll text Gina to tell you what it what it was. But no, since I think since six months we haven't gone. Yeah, so anything back. we did whatever the first one was, yeah. and he was. I put him down for a nap, and I picked him up, and he was. I thought he was dead. <gasps> Yeah. Stop it! I swear Emily. to God, uh, he was a noodle. Wait, like, this was this was when he came back. Yes. Yeah, so after. after the shot, we go home. I put him down, and I thought he was dead. And I, I, I mean, and he was fine. I mean, one second later, but I'd never picked him up. Whenever I picked him up, they do the response, you know, where they was he sleeping? He was sleeping. Okay, okay, got you. But I was like, he's been sleeping for so long. I need to go wake him up and feed him. Oh, and yeah. I picked him up, and he was really like a noodle. And I freaked. What'd you do? He was fine. Okay. I freaked out. I fucking kept vaccinating him. No, no, no. I meant like, what did you do? How'd you wake him up? Oh, I just kind of shook him. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. And he, he woke up. Yeah. And oh. I come to learn that that is a brain injury. Really? Yes. My son is extremely intelligent. So like, he is fine. Like my son is highly intelligent, extremely early verbal. Oh, I've never heard Super not that. autistic. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I remember I took him to somewhere and there was an OB, it was a birth fit thing. And this OB goes, she's from Texas. Well, that's the most non-autistic child I've ever seen. I was like, thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, well, what 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 makes what what do you think makes him non autistic? Like, what do you think she meant by that? He was extremely alert, extremely. How old, and how old is he at the time? He was like one. Okay. Yeah. Um. So anyway, 
I kept vaccinating him. Yeah. I didn't really make the connection in that moment because mm, I was still in the world that even though I had hesitancy, it was like, this is babies get really sleepy after vaccines okay, gotcha. and like they can sleep for a long time. And it's great. You'll get, they'll get eight hours of sleep. I'm like sick, you know, wow. but like, no. So we keep vaccinating and our OB, because we, va- I mean, I'm sorry, our pediatrician, because we vaccinated, she was super cool. She was like, it's your choice. And we're like, no, we feel comfortable with the choices we've made. And yeah, we're going to continue with these and that and whatever. And we did everything until COVID started. And that's when literally like within those first two weeks where everyone was at home, I was like, hey, you know what I want to do right now? Like, I don't know where this came from, but I was like, I want to watch all the things that I haven't taken the time to watch that everyone who doesn't vaccinate their kids has told me to watch. Mm. It just out of nowhere. I was like, we have all this time to just sit and watch YouTube. Yeah. Like, and our son slept a lot. So I was like, let's watch Vax. Let's let's watch this. Let's watch this. And we just did. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And people who are like pro, pro, pro will jump. De- I mean, we obviously know how psychotic they They're are. They're rabid. They are. We s- haven't had any like really bad responses from anyone. Like our, our pediatrician's really cool. And our first they don't, pediatrician they, threatened that's us. That's great. No, I mean like people. In our your- pediatrician, they yeah. don't even do them at their office. They're like, we don't we do not do them. Oh, where wow. do you go? Do you go to Hopewell? Yeah. That's Whoa. where, yeah, we, it, we we tried to get in there, but it was such a long wait list. But our first pediatrician threatened us. What? what she you... looked at us and she was like, listen, all of our other patients are vaccinated. So if you don't make the choice. I was like, bitch, bye. Yeah. Well, just, just for the, are you kidding just for the me? baby vac- vaccine? Like, yeah, for the, the regular baby, schedule? For the regular schedule. Really? And so that's when I actually went to my doula agency website and they had a list oh, of good. pediatricians in the Nashville area that either don't have vaccines in their office right. or don't push it on people. And I called Hopewell. They couldn't take her for like a long time. But then the place we went to now, they are so chill. She just says, she's, it's totally up to you. That's Do you what, have questions? Yeah, that's what they say. yeah. Do you have questions? Amazing. Yeah. So, so I'll just share something I learned. Okay, so I did give both my kids vitamin K. And after listening to, I mean, and learning so much and then listening to Candace's thing, like I was just like, how could you? Um, <laughs> no, vitamin K is is that like pretty soon after the is, baby's born, yeah. right? It's like pretty. Yeah. I think that's one of the it's ones supposed that we because the, they're circumcised to stop them from bleeding. right? Well, that's what they won't tell you. Yeah. Oh. They do it to everyone, but it's for. But do it, girls get them? Yes, or yeah. it's, it's also for a potential rare blood disorder. Okay, gotcha. Baby, I will share two really good podcasts, or one really good podcast you can listen to about that too. But anyway, um, so. What I didn't know is that a lot of vaccines that have aluminum in them, for example, aluminum is an adjuvant and the adjuvant is what stimulates the immune response because your body's like, why is there a fucking heavy metal in my body? I obviously need to attack this thing. And then that's what stimulates an immune response. And that's what is, you know, creates uh, immunity. (laughs) (laughs) Quink, wink. Uh, Did you guys know that none of your childhood shots are still good? But you haven't died yeah, yet. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. Oh, really? Can't yeah. believe I'm still walking. Still walking. So, what what shots would we have gotten? The big ones that are that aren't viable. Like, te- oh, well, tetanus isn't a virus. Um, polio, MMR, MMR, yeah. Um, measles, mumps, ru- rubella, polio. Oh, interesting. Even, I don't even so, know. no good now. No. Hmm. Um, most of them, at least. Man, I, I I'm not going to say all. <laughs> yeah, you need to get your we booster. Get um. So anyway, uh. What was crazy is during COVID, our pediatrician was like, I'm learning that the MMR booster is really like helpful in fighting COVID. And I was like, wow, that is a stretch. Um, And she's like, I'm so glad that my family all just got our booster shots. I'm like, oh, yeah, people actually like do that into adulthood. I kind of forgot about that. Wait, they got their MMR boosters? Yeah, like adults still do. (laughs) News to me. Yeah. Um, But so in these vaccines that have aluminum in them, which they market as harmless because it is trace amounts and um, aluminum in the bloodstream is no different than aluminum ingested. And mm-hmm. we alu- ingest aluminum all the time. Well, when you inject aluminum into your bloodstream with another compound slash chemical called polysorbate 80, which is in a lot of these vaccines, the polysorbate 80, which is very commonly used in chemotherapy, opens the blood brain barrier. Mm. So when you have aluminum in your brain, That's not good. that is no good. Mm. Oh, you Google aluminum toxicity, you easily heard of that. Yeah. See a lot of shit that we're dealing with 
very What's commonly. What's going on now? Where a lot of people are putting memes of like microplastics. Yeah. What is? What are the micro? What are they talking about? It's just like well, that's mic- a whole they're, other they're like thing. Microplastics and everything. Right? Yeah. Like, that, the food you eat just microplastics. Did you listen to that Joe Rogan podcast with Dr. Shanna Swan? Mm-mm. No. Oh my god. You have to. Okay. This is not related to vaccines. Yeah, my wife. My wife is probably watching this episode and is having a mixture of like, that's not what happened. I didn't do that. We didn't do that. What are you talking about? And yes, I did watch that. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Probably, probably. Oh, um, I see. I'm definitely going to have to it's, watch it's this. It's amazing. Yeah. But um, we chose, okay, so we did give our daughter one vaccine because I got coerced by my pediatrician and I am so fucking mad. My husband wasn't quite on board. He was 99% there, but he's like, she really recommends one vaccine before we Which get one? on a plane. The uh, um, pneumococcal, which mm. is meningitis. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I... I wrote the mom email of a lifetime after I got that shot. I said, you got it. No, after I gave uh, it, okay, we gave yeah, it to yeah. our daughter. I was like, I need you to know how inappropriate that was. If I was a first time mom, I would never write this email. But as a second time mom and knowing what I know now, like I can't believe how disrespectful of our opinions you were. And you've basically coerced us to do this. I, like you say, you're, you told us you will do whatever we say. And I did not feel that from you at all. I get you're stressed out from COVID, but you need to like lighten up. I straight up said that in email. Wait, so what, what prompted the email? That I got that shot without really wanting to. And I felt so uncomfortable after that appointment. Yeah. And I don't blame my husband at all because he was like kind of, he wasn't siding with her. He was like, we're going on a plane. You know, we were just, sure. it was the heat of the moment yeah. thing. And I, I'm glad I had that experience because it really made me realize just how fucking crazy and corrupt the pediatric vaccine system is. Like she was visibly upset that, that you were I was about thinking not about it. not giving her a vaccine. Yeah, that's how my first pediatrician And I was, was just like, we, yeah. we didn't have time to switch. We were moving in like two weeks. So we were very stressed out. So mm-hmm. it was just like a combination of all these things. Um, I told my husband, I was like, I'm never giving our child another shot. And you need to get on board with that. <laughs> and he that's was like, a, yeah, that's uh, kind of how Carly. She does a lot of the research. And it, I almost feel like I'm calling myself lazy. But I trust her. Whatever she wants to do, I'm, I'm on board with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's fine. And then when you have this intuition that's like, hang on a sec, you know, I trust you. Yeah. But maybe there's more, you know. I haven't had that. I haven't had that yet. That's great. You know, um, and especially like that intuition that is, you know, we don't tell women to trust their intuition. We tell them to trust science. Yeah. And trust authority. (laughs) Yeah. I think a woman's intuition is way like way stronger than i don't know if that's, it is that's a very, very like, different male like, intuition in a fatherly sense is um, protect. Yeah, motherly intuition is on another level on another like. level yeah um but when it comes to vaccines the more people i meet adults who are unvaccinated adults who have never vaccinated their children books i've read things i've read they're the healthiest kids in the world yeah and it's like yeah. wait you don't ever have like I, hang on a sec. <laughs> I we have I don't want to s- say who it is, but we, a guest on our show um, vaccinated one of their kids and didn't vaccinate the rest, and they see a difference in yeah. the oh, really? health of the kids. They see yeah, a, a pretty stark difference, like even down to like John allergies. Doyle. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> one of John's kids. John, <laughs> um, let's do one more question. Yeah. then we got to wrap up because got a baby to go back to. Um, <laughs> how we talked about this? How to get husbands on board with a oh. home delivery? <laughs> amazing question to end on. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, First thing I always say is you shouldn't have to convince your husband of anything. You're a team, okay? If you think you have to convince him to do something your way, I would go to marriage therapy. Um, But men who think that giving birth out of the hospital don't know anything, period. End of statement, end of sentence. And I'm not saying you're stupid, yeah. I'm not I am saying you don't know anything about home birth because if you knew anything about home birth you'd choose a home birth. So you need to inform your husband on the actual data. If you go to my Instagram page, I have those statistics I read in a post and we'll share the study yeah. in the notes. Um now, if it's a finance thing, okay, figure it out. Sorry. 
if that sounds harsh. If it doesn't work out, that's okay. Have a hospital birth. But if you have access to out-of-hospital care and you know the research and the safety behind it and you've consulted with actual midwives and you still choose a hospital birth, fine. I don't think many people would. Go talk to a real midwife. Ask them questions. You shouldn't have to be the only one to help your husband understand. You don't need to be their freaking encyclopedia. Go talk to people. Go talk to a midwife. Talk to a doula. I, I do consultations. Talk mm-hmm. to me. Listen to this podcast. Um, I think that I want to, when I work with couples, I want to minimize resentment. I want to minimize um any disagreement like you have to be on the same page you know when I talk about circumcision that's a hot one too um I share my opinion and I say I don't care what you do but you have to agree for the same reason you know it's the same thing about a home birth you have to agree for the same reason you have to understand that doesn't mean you need to resign to your husband because he doesn't know anything right you need to let him know right don't be afraid if he's not going to hear it that's a marriage that's problem. A problem. That's that's a different problem. Yeah, yeah, but I think there are very few husbands out there. That's what I'm saying. That would that excuse would, me. You want a home birth? We're not. Yeah, doing that. I, right. I, I like, get why a lot of husbands are initially uh, resistant to it. For sure, I think it's, it's, I think it's, it's from a place. No, I think of, it's scary. I think it's scary it is. for husbands. Yeah, it we is. I'm just gonna say it's we, very we're not. We're not them. the ones going through it. We're the ones having a visual response to the things that are going on. Right. And not even that we're helpless, but it's just that when No, you- you're scared because we have been conditioned in a medicalized world where the white coats save lives. That's what that's what I we think. We don't too. know yeah, we- what midwives do. Yeah. We have no we have no exposure to midwives. Yeah. If this was eighteen thirty Exactly. It wouldn't even be a conversation. You know, no. the husband knows what to do. Go get the hot water. Here's the towel. most important question of all. Yeah. You know where I'm going with this. No. Do you consider your husband your best friend? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Oh. Oh. Sad. <laughs> that, was that our first guest who gave that answer? I think it was our first guest who gave that answer. No. Well, someone else. Someone else. Oh. Oh, by the way, Elijah, you have in your uh, Instagram bio that your wife's your best friend, <laughs> by the way. Does he? Yeah. No, uh, there are reasons, and we'll be talking about this in an Obviously, the having a male friend and a girlfriend are very different. So in that regard, like my best girlfriends are my best, girl- are my best friends. But my husband is my... Best friend for life. Mm. BFF, mm-hmm. best friend forever. You can judge me. You can think it's silly. I don't care. <laughs> actually, I actually respect that. She's like, whatever, judge me. <laughs> I'm just thinking. I'm, I'm just thinking. Mike's going to do a man on the street um, thing tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. yeah so maybe it'll come out on Friday. Yeah. I, I, I believe that, you know. that well, Your answer might change in 30 years. It might. My yeah. husband and I have had a really interesting relationship. And this could be a whole nother podcast. But like. We have a really big age gap. We're 16 years apart. Which, which is, I would have never guessed. He's 20? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's almost 49. Oh. Yeah. I'm almost 33. And um, we started out as friends. So we were best friends. Mm-hmm. And we like we worked together. And then we started dating. And then we broke up twice because he was too old for me. <laughs> yeah. And then I realized he was the one. Came back crawling. And we have been together ever since. And, you know, rather than like my best friend, maybe, I don't think that really nails the like gravity of the relationship. See, that's once, I think once a person starts thinking yeah. about it, I then really they get there. believe they get he's there. like my soulmate. Okay, soulmate's different than best yeah. friend. Yeah. 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 And, cause like he annoys the fuck out of me too, like all the time. As husbands do. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, and I do push back on things and he pushes back on me. Like we have our pushbacks, but we respect each other. And, you know, publicly I would stand by him no matter what. You never introduce him to someone as your best friend though, really. <laughs> my best friend. <laughs> if it's you're going to, if that's, ha- you know what? Mate. So I guess he's not my best friend. You're okay. right. Um, <laughs> so we shouldn't try to convince anybody. No, I mean, you know we I mean? didn't, like, we didn't. You just let them work it out. Yeah. They get there. They arrive there. It's such a big, uh, getting back on the subject before we go, but it's such a, a very weird place that we're at now where like the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, you know, the father goes into a waiting room. He's not even present really right. in the delivery, right. you know, aspect part of it. They go drinking with their buddies. Yeah. yeah. They have cigars in the waiting yeah. room, smoke cigarettes and stuff. Hey, when it's all in. So I think that's probably another like deconditioning thing or conditioning Absolutely. a guy not to necessarily want to be involved. So when you say, hey, babe, 
we're going to have a home birth. You're going to be there holding my hand. You're going to see all the poop come out. And I might throw up mm-hmm. a couple times. They're probably like, I don't, I don't, where's the waiting room? Give me the waiting room. <laughs> I mean, my, I, it, it transformed our relationship. And <laughs> I get like, that. I was, <clears throat> when I saw her, I was fine. Like getting the scrubs put on, getting ready to go into the OR. I'm like, yeah, this, I'll be behind the curtain. And you don't really see much. You can, but you don't really see much because they got to pull your guts out. But, um, I remember she turned to me and her teeth were chattering. I guess yeah, because of the meds. I like I felt the blood like leave my face. Mm-hmm. Like I I for sure was white and I was like like my mouth went dry. I was like, I'm probably gonna pass out. Yeah. At some point. It gets really gnarly. Yeah. My dad f- put a camera on a tripod and for you filmed oh. my mom having to see because back then you could do that. Yeah. Yeah. And then he said in the moment he was right there watching it, taking pictures, and he was like totally fine. And then when he went to get the photos developed, oh, God. he looked at them and he almost puked. Yeah. Because like the adrenaline in the oh, yeah. Was, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was like, this is cool. Yeah. But then afterwards, he was like very sick. Yeah. <laughs> we'll end it on that. Look, thank you, Emily, for coming Thank on. you Emily so much. Emily had to travel here. She left her two children at home with dad. So thank you for coming. I hope thank you'll come you. on again. Thanks, if you Emily. guys, yeah. w- what I'll do is I'm going to send you the rest of these questions. Okay. Yeah. And then maybe you can answer them on your page and tag us and we can Ooh, share it because there's yeah. a lot of really good questions. Thank you guys so much for participating. And and we'll sending her, questions. We'll put her Instagram up in the description, cool. all yeah. that good stuff. We'll put all that good info. Thank you. Go have more babies. Please. Should we end it on that? And then hire Emily. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, teaching a birth education course in May and I teach it like every other month. And then I actually do a doula training course also. Do that. All you. online. Huh? Oh, online? Yeah. You don't have to be in Texas? No. Okay. On Zoom. <laughs> all on Zoom. I got to no. pee. Okay. Bye. I'm gonna, and I'm bye. Gonna, bye. Bye. Just let it, let, let it come. Let it fall. Let it like fall. Like a out. waterfall. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, that was two hours. That was rad. So rad.